So here's my buddy with no further delay, Mr. Dave DeCourcy out of Massachusetts. So when he says potty and pot the car and stuff like that. Pots. And pots. That's right. Pots. It was, I was pots in your last night. <clears throat> not pots. It's pots. <laughs> You'll uh, maybe need a translator. Anyway, Dave DeCourcy. Thank you, Gene. This is going to be one of two parts. One of two pots. Parts? Pots. <clears throat> you guys can understand me. But this is one of two parts. We, I'm going to try to get to the case study tonight. We can get to one case study, and that's about it. The second night's going to be all case studies, and it's, you know, it covers a lot. So here's my buddy with no further delay, Mr. Dave DeCourcy out of Massachusetts. So when he says potty and pot the car and stuff like that. Pots. And pots. That's right. Pots. It, was, it was pots in your last night. It's not night. pots. It's pots. <laughs> You'll uh, maybe need a translator. Anyway, Dave DeCourcy. Thank you, Gene. Thanks. This is going to be one of two parts. One of two pots. Parts? Pots. <clears throat> you guys can understand me. But this is one of two parts. We, uh, I'm going to try to get to the case study tonight. We can get to one case study, and that's about it. The second night's going to be all case studies, and it's, you know, it covers a lot of things. We've got airbag um, issues like with Toyota and Lexus, just for instance, that the warning indicator's on. We've got good communication, no DTC. The transistor, the gate is locked. It's stuck, and this light will not go off. And that's just a common problem. We're going to get into the common problems, we're going to go into, uh, the second night, we're going to go into problem solving. I'm going to ask you guys, how'd you attack it? I got a waveform library I started a while ago. I use scopes on these cars. I use scopes on these cars. <clears throat> I got a bit of a sore throat, so I asked you to be with me tonight. I'm going to try to talk as loud as I can. And then we're going to get into programming. Programming can take me, you know, I work on, I only go back 10 years. And that's it, as far as I go back, 10 years. For me to work on something older than that, I mean, the customer's got to be willing to spend the diagnostic. And basically, what I do for a living is I just go into a shop and I find a new diagnostic direction. Um, I worked in the dealers for 23 years, and I've been doing my own um, mobile service for right now going on 13 years. So <clears throat> I do the same thing as your buddy, everybody's buddy Johnny does, Johnny Anello. <clears throat> I just have a nicer truck, that's all. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it's not yellow. <laughs> It's not, it doesn't look like Big Bird. All right, but write that in the back. Again, if you don't understand any part, any questions, you might have questions tomorrow. We're going to cover a lot of material. Yell, you got to yell, because I'll keep this going. I'm so excited about this. Um, I'm one of these guys who can't get enough. I couldn't do enough research when I was at the deal. There wasn't enough time. And flat rate, you couldn't take the time to learn. You, it was too much money involved. I get the chance. I learn new things every day. SRS and the transducers and EVAP has been my pet peeve for years. And those are three things I, 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 I do the most of. Now, Massachusetts, we had a plug and play for DLC for mass uh, inspections. Last year, last October, if the SRS light's on, you don't, get, you don't get a sticker. You fail. So it went from me doing three or four, maybe five cars a week with SRS problems to maybe three or four a day now. And I just do, I, I could do airbags all day long. And I get challenged every day, to be honest with you. And... Um, I love it. I love it. I can't get enough. can't get enough. When you can learn something every day, 
you know, I, I just can't get enough training. I, I just, I love doing research. But we're going to cover theory, operation, and diagnostic. Okay, the class objectives, we're going to cover the history, hazardous waste regulations, theory and operation, passenger SRS system, which we could just cover in three and a half hours, that by itself, safety precautions, diagnosis of common SRS systems. I'm going to try to land into that. Waveform library and SRS uh, review. I didn't write programming here because that's really part of the second class. So we'll take this as far as we can go. <laughs> All right, we have primary, or some people call it passive restraint, and then we have SRS, supplementary restraints. Now, what do these terms mean to you? If I said primary restraints, what are we talking about? Seatbelts. Seat and the seatbelts have to work properly. Uh, we have three generations of airbags out right now. Uh, I only work, i be honest with you, I see mostly two and three. You guys, a lot of you will see number one. But regardless of what we have, the seatbelt is the primary the, the supplement. When I ask people what's an airbag system, they don't attach it to the seatbelt. But it's an addition to the seatbelt. The, the whole principle of this thing is if you're latched, if you're restrained in, and you get in an accident, a moderate to severe accident, not a light hit. <clears throat> when the airbag goes off, if you're held in place, you'll be protected as most as you possibly can. Now, seatbelts are a big thing right now because what is one of the most common parts that are going to wear out all the time? If you're an avid seatbelt user, you're constantly plugging the belt in and out, in and out. What's going to go bad? The switch. The switch. Now, generation one and two, you might just have a light that blinks on, whatnot. And, but generation number three, that's an input. That's a major input. So and, and with the um, modules of termination, if it's going to suppress it, it's going to stay suppressed. Nothing gets deployed. If it's going to do single stage or it's going to get dual stage. So a seat buckle is a big thing. The seat buckle right now will turn the light on. And it's just not a simple resistance check. Is it good or bad? It's a little bit more to that. How many seatbelt securing points are in a late model vehicle? Late model now. Not back when I was a kid. We had rubber, yeah, three. And we need them. We need the shoulder belt and we need the lap belt. The lap belt can't go across your stomach and the shoulder belt can't go around your neck. It can't go your back. The whole idea for you to position yourself is it's going to cover your lower torso and it's going to come down across your shoulder. And it's very important because a lot of the new cars coming out right now, I know Mercedes has it. We talked about it when my Mercedes Mechanics Monday is we have rear seat belt airbags. If it's around your neck and it deploys, is that could be an issue. That could be a big issue. We'll cover that soon. <clears throat> what function should the seatbelt be capable of performing during an aggressive stopping maneuver? I take the car, normally I take the car down the street and I slam on the brakes so I aggressively stop. What should that seatbelt do? Because oh. oh. Exactly, that's what it needs to do. That's what it needs to do. And when the airbag, whether it's on the reel, the pretension, or whether it's on the reel or on the buckle itself, it's going to take up the distance between you and that cover. And I'm talking about the module cover. It's going to take the distance up between you two. But if it doesn't stop you, there's going to be issues. So if the seatbelts, I can't tell you how major of an influence it is. They only work together. Um, and some of the new ones, you've got to really find out. The new ones work with the airbag. When the airbags deploy, some of the late model ones will give a little. Will give a little. So if, you know, again, the airbags are meant to work with the seatbelts, and they both have to work. As of 2000, I say about 2001, 2002, all U.S. sold vehicles had to have a seatbelt warning indicator system. I'm still going bouncing back for a few years because I do read it, and I see the regulation change from year to year. But basically, it's, it's that one that constantly rings and rings and rings and rings. The one that you just can't turn the radio up loud enough. And the one your wife can't. Out tune. It's just, it's, trust me, it's the one that's the most annoying one. Um, the supplement re restraint system helps prevent serious head, neck, and chest injuries. That's what it's all about. You can still get injured, but we're not talking brain damage. We're not talking snapping the neck. We're not talking damaging your whole chest cavity. If you go in the hospital because of the, I mean, you could have symptoms where you have aches after a deployment. That's only normal. You could have some scratches, you could have some abrasions, you could have some burns. But we're trying to prevent major, major problems. Um, for the supplement uh, restraint system to protect the occupant of the vehicle, seat belts must be used to properly position the passenger in the seat. You're not going to be laying over on the door panels. You're not going to be, you know, the seat. You, you, my wife likes to drive around. She has her feet up on the dash. If I slam into somebody, there's nothing to really stop her. 
She'd be like a missile going out the windshield. That's the way they are. It's kind of hard to tell the older people like myself how to drive. But, and to the first, uh, first time I bought a van, my first van was in 08. I bought a new van and it, it had a problem with seat belts. And the seat belts were defective. That van had to be a loner because right now I, I set it up on the board right there. There's a complete system and the, everything on that, that board is live. It does a self-check fine and the pretensioners are deployed. That means I've got two open circuits. So what happens if, the pre, if it was on the reel or the pretensioners, the belt's got, the belt, if you would step on the brake, it's not going to stop you. If, they, if it's not plugged in, I can't stand here in the dinging. And the pretensioners already went off and I couldn't get the parts. It took me two or three years to get the parts. So actually, I had to sit on the seat belt. Was that going to help me at all during a crash? Absolutely not. But I wouldn't, you know, I need the vehicle for work. The driver and passengers must be positioned far enough away from the airbag module, at least 10 inches from the occupant's breast bone to the, the module cover. This is why. <clears throat> we have the first part of the deployment. And I'm going to ask you guys about 15 questions. Tomorrow when you start working on these cars, I don't want you thinking about 15 things. I want you to know about it right away. The first two or three inches of deployment is the most powerful part of the deployment. Okay, that's the wrist zone. That's why we need to wear a seatbelt. If we try to do is after the first two or three inches, it's the most powerful part, it's the fastest part of the deployment, it's inflating the bag and breaking through the cover. It needs all that effort. Once it breaks through the cover, it slows down. It slows down. What happens if we're not secured in the vehicle? We go down the street, we see we got a, somebody cuts us off, we step on the brake. We step on the brake, that's called pre-braking. I slam on the brake. I'm not restrained. What's the chance I can get my body really close to that steering wheel? Really close. If I hit that two or three inch area and I'm not secured, could I have serious neck injuries, head injuries? Could I be killed? I could be killed. And that's what was happening. Most of the people weren't being restrained. And understand, the first two or three inches is where we call it the wrist zone. So if we have pre-braking, if we have pre-braking um, and we're not fastened up, now we brought ourselves closer to the airbag. If the airbag decides to inflate, or the module decides to deploy that airbag, we're going to be in an area where it's going to blast us right in the face. It's going to do more damage than good. So the first two or three inches is the risk area. Pre-braking is what's slowing down before we actually uh, have the collision. And again, if we're not secured, it's going to pull us down. It's going to put us right into an area. The biggest thing we had problems with was when the people putting the, the children getting killed. We're taking the rear face and car seats. Now, if we have a pickup truck, we have no choice. But we were taking the rear face and car seat, and the kids, the baby's head and the edge of the car seat would be facing the windshield, right? It'd be, most of the time, this, if it knows them, they're sitting on the dash or within an inch or two away from the dash. Is that... Is that holder, that carrier, is that in the wrist zone? Yeah, that's why these kids were being hurt and killed. We gotta stay out of that wrist zone. If we're 10 inches back, and it basically, if we have to sit close, we got short legs, short stature, we can't get that far out of the pedals, we can't get that far away from the um, steering wheel with, with the back seat fully upright, what can we quickly do? We can make the back recline a little. But you always want the airbag facing your, facing your chest. You don't want to face up, like my kid likes to drive with the steering wheel kind of facing up because it really tilts up in the old cars. But that, when that inflates, is that really going to protect his face? No, he could go right up over it. If you're not properly held in place, could you go underneath the dash? Could you go to the left or the right side of the airbag? You could. That's why this 10 inches is most critical. We like to be at the end of that 10 inches. The first two or three inches is what zone? The wrist zone. And if we're not secured, can we get in that wrist zone during pre-braking? Yeah, so we're just asking for trouble. Even with me, I couldn't get parts for my car. I mean, my, my, my service van, my first service van, and I had to deal with that. I'm saying, you know, but I don't drive that much. I'm an old geezer, so I drive 30, 40 miles an hour. And if I don't, all the stuff goes flying out of the van. Okay, a quick brief history. A uh, gentleman in 1953 came up with a patent for the first airbag cushions. And with basically, it's a safety cushion. Went for a ride one day with his daughter. They pulled over the side of the road. They got, excuse me, they got cut off. They went off the side of the road and almost hit a boulder. He did all he could do to stop the kid and his wife from contacting any of the interior parts. He came back to the house. Six months later, he got a pattern for an airbag cushion. Now, uh, 
German inventor Walter Linderer, same time, 1953. So my, my point is this stuff's been out and the patents were done over 50 years ago. This is like a hybrid car. We had great technology for hybrids in the 70s. Could we use them? No, we didn't have the solid state device. We didn't have the modules or computers quick enough to run them. So even though these things come out 50 or 30, you know, 50, over 50 years ago, they came out with, the, it was a great idea, inspired by the automatic, uh, automotive manufacturers to start experimenting with, so they started experimenting in the late 50s with airbags. But again, we just couldn't get them working. We were lacking on the computer end. Then uh, Alan Breed in the 60s, he invented electromechanical crash sensors. And he's the one that started this whole process off. And what's an electromechanical uh, crash sensor? We'll take a, like nowadays, we take a, it's like a accelerometer. We're going to take a steel ball, we're going to put it in a magnetic field. We're going to have a ramp and a switch. There's got to take a lot of effort or an impact to get the ball to get the loosen its, to come out of that magnetic field. Then it's going to roll up the ramp and put the switch on. Well, again, <clears throat> he came up with that in the 60s and it turned this whole thing around. Uh, his company, Key Safety Incorporated, works with OEMs to design and develop safety features to protect the vehicle's occupants during a collision impact. He's one of several companies that work with the OEMs. They partner it up and they make safety devices. It's just not the OEMs coming up with the idea. Key Safety partnered with Ford Motor Company to develop the rear seatbelt airbag. It's going to be in all the 2011 Explorers. Now, all the other stuff, all the front airbags, the curtains or canopy airbags, side airbags, door airbags, they're pyrotechnic, they're heat device. In the back, that airbag is going to come across your waist. It's going to come up over your shoulder and it's going to go over the top of your shoulder. But it's coming across your chest. Do we really want to make the person uncomfortable and put heat right there? No. So inside, underneath the seat, and the belt buckle is a big thing for this, underneath the seat there's a pre-charged uh, container of cold air of gas. And what happens is if the SRS decides to deploy it, the canister empties through the bucket, I mean through the seat belt, out of the bucket at the bottom of the seat, comes up through the seat belt, and it actually rip open the belt and uh, like an accordion and it protects you. It protects you. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what coming. So that's gas charge. We're gonna use cold air, but the rest of the system is hot. And hot it can, literally it can burn you. It can burn you in a sense of situations. In 55, Ford offered seat belts as an option on their vehicles. Seat belt reminder warning indicators were being equipped in 2,000 model year vehicles. All automobiles sold in the United States are required to have an SRS system as standard equipment in 1998 in the light duty trucks the next year. All passenger cars and light trucks produced after September 1st, 2006 and this is really important, are required to have the advanced frontal airbags. They call them smart airbags. This is what we're seeing a lot of right now. Passenger side presence systems. 2006, we got passenger side presence systems. They're all being equipped. At that point, this advance, that's what we're going to roll right into right now. The advance, the computer itself decides if it's going to stay in suppression mode, which it doesn't apply anything, nothing gets um, uh, deployed, or it's going to be, it determines it's a moderate, uh, impact, which may do just single stage, or it'll do dual stage for a severe uh, impact, a high velocity impact. Passenger cars and light trucks, pickups, SUV and vans that have a gross vehicle weight of 8,500 pounds or less and an unloaded vehicle weight of 5,500 pounds or less. And that's how it fell into. So 2006. What year do we have to have airbags? What year? 98. And when they had to be advanced? That's generation three. 2006. <clears throat> Airbag modules, they contain hazardous chemicals that are harmful to the environment. We can have two different chemicals, uh, two different chemicals could be used, excuse me, sodium azide and potassium nitrate. Sodium azide is an explosive. That's the simplest way to call it. Advanced airbag doesn't take into consideration the size and the weight. <clears throat> We're going to get into that. We're going to get to that, like in a couple more slides. I'm trying to flip through the slides, the first part, and then we're going to get into that. Yeah, it's the weight of the person, the, the seat position, buckled, unbuckled. It has a lot. Vehicle speed has a lot to do with it. It has a lot to do with it. Uh, sodium azide is an explosive with an, oxid an oxidizer. It doesn't need anything from the outside air. It doesn't need any ambient air, anything. 
to create the nitrogen gas it produces to inflate the bags. It's self-contained. Potassium nitrate is an oxidizer. Um, regulation, but they're both poisonous. They're both poisonous to the environment. So how can we make them not poisonous? Deploy the bags. Now, understand, with the advanced bags, uh, the advanced systems, or the smart bags, generation three, it can do a single stage deployment. You need to deploy the other side of that bag. Now, the bag may not inflate, because a lot of times we just get them making a lot of noise, but as a preventive, I cut the bags off, and I'll ignite the second bag. Because I want to do is, before it goes, the stuff gets thrown in the scrap pile, or in the dumpster, I want to make sure there's nothing poisonous. If it gets in the water, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. And how many cars since 1998 are required to have airbags? All of them, <clears throat> except for heavy-duty trucks. Regulation and interpretation different from state to state. Hazardous waste is not deployed. Non-hazardous waste is deployed. What I did a little different in this class is I wanted you to hang on to these um, handouts. A lot of times I'll go to class and there's just one or two bullets and you got to take a lot of notes. The stuff I want to talk to you about is written right on the screen. So I want to go over and if you get any questions, I want you to um, ask. I like a lot of feedback. But again, the information that I want you to know that I would normally have you write down, I put it on the screen. I want to try it a little different. I don't want to spend, you guys spent the whole night writing. Okay, in the state of Connecticut, is an undeployed airbag a hazardous waste? Yes. Do you need a special permit? Yes. Is it deployed airbag hazardous waste? No. Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York. Yes, no, no. You don't need a special permit here. But once they're deployed, are they hazardous waste? No, we've used up the substance inside that's actually poisonous. Excellent. Okay. This is the biggest thing for a while I've been trying to tell people. Um, when I go into shops, I go into multiple shops during the day. And I'll be honest with you, again, I'm only there to find a new diagnostic direction. And I really love, uh, really love doing what I do. But what I do is I grab the technician, I'll talk to the owner of the foreman, I'll grab the technician, we'll go through the test that he's done again, and then I'll pick a path and we'll go down the path. But when I'm always teaching these guys, and I'm teaching them in every shop, I do it every day, um, it's current that deploys these, air, deploys these airbags. It's current. It's a voltage divider circuit. Okay, and I'm thinking voltage divider. If we, if we don't make it comparison is the same, but if we say a simple ECT circuit, right? Engine cooling temperature, right? We got five volts on one side and we got signal return on the other. Just think about it, it's a split circuit. It's a divider circuit. That might be too simple and too basic, but I wanted to say something. If I have an open circuit, I could see source voltage or greater. But when I load the circuit and complete it and attach it to an inflator, it's going to bring the voltage down to what it normally should be. Um, so it's current that applies these bags. Currents are only in the circuit during deployment. During deployment. So current amperage is sent to the pyrotechnic devices, pretensions the airbags by the SRS module. Once the internal calculated deployment threshold is reached, whether it's moderate or severe, the side and back, the side impact sensors and the front impact sensors don't determine if this thing gets deployed. They're an input. It can use that totally or it's going to compare with the internal circuits. Once it compares the two or if one's higher than the other, we have to meet a threshold. It's a calculation. We have to reach a threshold. We have a lower threshold for moderate and then a higher threshold for what? Severe. And it has to reach those calculations. But it's not the actual, I don't want anybody to think that the, uh, that the crash sensors determine that it, once, once it crashes or the shock is, 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 uh, is felt hot enough that um, it determines if they get uh, fired or not. It's still up to the SRS module to come out of suppression mode. The igniter can be either a hot wire device or a silicone chip semiconductor bridge circuit. Either way, it's a resistance. It's a resistance. The semiconductor, uh, this could be multiple resistors, hot wire. You know, we're thinking that as like a heater. But what is it there to do? It's there to ignite the sodium oxide. And it's, it does it really fast. Most of these airbags will deploy in five milliseconds. How many milliseconds in a, in a second? A thousand. A thousand. You blink your eye, 200 milliseconds. The fastest your eye can see is 100 milliseconds. That's why if you put a pen in front of your eye and you hold it down about a quarter inch and you keep going like this, what does it look like after a while? Like it's bending, right? 
and it's not the drugs you did in high school. It looks like it's bending. Well, it's, it's, it's retinal retention, and it's as fast as your eye can pick it up. So these airbags get deployed faster than you say, faster than you actually say. The sodium azide and potassium nitrate are ignited inside the canister stove, producing a rapid buildup of harmless nitrogen gas. Again, these are self-contained, so they need any oxygen to pull this off. We compare this to like rockets, rocket uh, fuel up in space. Does it need oxygen to ignite them? No, it's all self-contained. It builds up a harmless gas, which rapidly fills the airbag. Now, right here, I'm going to pass around a stove. This is off a of 99 Aurora. The igniter uh, is in the center, and that stove is where the explosion happens, and the gas gets produced, and you'll see it. It's pretty well melted. I'm going to pass a lot of things around tonight, so I want you guys to take a peek at it. But again, is it voltage or current that sets these off? Current. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. Early versions of the airbag cushions use a harmless cornstarch or talcum powder substance to lubricate the airbag. We need to unfold and come out as quickly as we could. Okay? This is the smoke that seems to appear. A lot of people, when you detonate a bag, it looks like smoke. And what happens is, what's the cover of the inside of the car with? Powder. Now, with the insurance, I work with insurance companies that work with a lot of body shops. I go look at the cars before they start working on them. And it was funny because in the later years, I was asking the guys, like in 07, 08, I go, dude, you guys clean up these cars ahead of time? There's no powder. And I said, I got to figure out why these cars got no powder. Because I always have to know everything as far as what, you know, again, this is a pet peeve, so I just, I want to know everything about it. The later versions of airbag cushions were made with, or lubricated with silicone. Silicone is very what? Slippery. So the bag will unfold real quickly. And then we won't have the smoke, we won't have the powder. I, you know, it can, if, if some people have said that it affects, if they get asthma or whatnot, they can't breathe that in. They can't breathe that in. But the whole deployment, the whole in, um, inflation, deflation, happens in less than a second happens in less than a second. So it's a very fast time. Non-reusable, it's one time use for strength. All right, this is what I want to get into. We got three generations of airbags. First generation, single stage. This is the way my, I like to see, I look at it, I approach it. Single stage deployment was so fast it could result in personal injury or even death, especially concerning children and the elderly. I started seeing these on like 86. I was working the dealer. So if I got an 86 car that was used, like a Topaz, we'd see how many airbags in the car? One, just the driver's side. Just the driver's side. <clears throat> but they came, out they came out extremely fast. Extremely fast. Um, if we weren't held in place, what part of this deploy deployment do we have to worry about? The first two or three inches. First two or three inches, could it kill you? Yes, could it give you severe, uh, it could create severe harm. Will it protect you if you're in the, if the seat belt's fastened down? Yeah, it will. Later version, second generation, single stage airbag modules were depowered. Were depowered. The deployment speeds will slow down to prevent personal injuries or even death. Or even death. So we slowed them down. And I was seeing that in like about 98. Third generation, we're going to see the most of these. Uh, also referred as the Smart or Advanced Airbag Module, the SRS control unit uses additional sensor inputs to determine if the airbag module will deploy at what rate. Single stage is deployed when a lower velocity collision impact is detected. Dual stage is deployed when a higher velocity collision impact is detected. Shutting off, we call that suppression. If it doesn't hit the moderate, is it going to deploy anything? No, we call that suppression. It decided not to deploy anything. There wasn't a need. Okay, uh, a couple of things I just wanted to jot down here. This is more of a caution, I just, but I put it down here. Airbag modules deploy if vehicles are on fire. The vehicle inside temperature reaches close to 400 degrees. They're going to go off. They're going to go off. <clears throat> cheap vehicles, I just put this in as, a, as again, as a part of a caution. Cheap vehicles will deploy curtain airbags and seat belts on rollovers. So what aren't we not going to do? We're not going to take the control unit and, we are, and we're not going to plug it in and we're not going to rotate it about 30 or 40 degrees because what can we simulate? A rollover. And they will go off. They will go off. You know, there are strategies, but you've got to wonder how some of these strategies work. 
I went to do an 08 uh, CN event, Toyota CN event, where, um, I mean, excuse me, a Honda, um, what was it? Yeah, Toyota CN, right? And um, the car went right through the side of the car. A car broadsided right through the car. They got a driver's door, they got a sliding door, and they got a rear, big rear, rear quarter glass. The car went right through the door, in between the B and the C pillar. The B and the C pillar both had crash sensors on it. It bent the floor in a foot and a half, and the roof in a half, foot and a half. It was low miles and it was loaded. They fixed the vehicle. We get it all done. <clears throat> the body shop calls me and says, Dave, customer's standing right here. You gotta come down tomorrow. You gotta tell us what happened. What's going on? You gotta make a determination. I said, what's going on? He goes, Dave, that car got hit at about 50 miles an hour. We don't know why they told. I said, yeah, I saw it. I come out there originally to see it. He goes, <clears throat> the lady goes to pick up the car. They get it all done. Didn't deploy any bags. So she said the right front door was a little sticky. So the body guys, they went and they adjusted the right front door. And they're looking at the, the latch, I mean the catch, and the striker pin, and they needed it to come back a little, just down a little. So the guy tapped the hammer. And it deployed the bags and ruined the headliner on the driver's side, on the passenger side. So a car could go through it and not set it off. So what was the strategy to say moderate to severe? I think that was way off. But what I have noticed, and I, I, I do tell you this over and over, there's a real good chance if an impact did not set off a crash sensor, if it didn't, um, if, the, if the car was in a good moderate to severe impact or less, the crash sensors, whether front or the side, can be more sensitive. I had a car that hit a pothole doing 30 miles an hour, tore the side of the tire and broke the bead. I put my cell phone in it. I got pictures of it. It deployed every airbag in the car, except for the drivers and the passenger on the instrument cluster. That means all the curtains, all the seat belts, everything. The adjuster came in. They basically put it down for four thousand. It was ninety-six hundred dollars in airbag parts before my fee. Ninety-six hundred. So I go. I can't believe a simple pothole would have set this off. The crash sensor, there's a crash sensor and a rollover sensor in this car, if she didn't tip it, and she didn't tip it, that has to be way too sensitive. I wonder if this car's been in an accident. So I grabbed the boss, I said, hey, I want you to text, even though we're going to strip the inside of the car, put rollover sensors and whatnot, I want all the upholstery off the side. I want all the panels off the quarter panels, the doors. I'm going to look for a few uh, previous accidents. He said, what are you looking for? I think the airbag on the driver's side, I think the crash sensors are too sensitive. But I don't think they were that great from the factory. I think it's been a, it's been a, it's been, it was impacted before, there was a collision, and now they're really sensitive. They're really sensitive. He had, I had him stripped the hole down, the whole quarter panel was welded all the way to the C pillar. It was welded, welded, welded. It got a good side impact. Now, for the curtain airbags and the seat to go off, it, thank you very much, it's not a frontal impact, it's a side impact or a rollover. So I, for now, for that point, I said, for now, you know, it determined that I was seeing this more and more. Simple accidents, simple people knocking bumper covers off, some from, and they already had previous major body work, was making the sensors too soft, too um, sensitive, way too sensitive. So a lot of cars, I'll go up there, and I'm going to show you a few. It's going to be food for thought. I'm going to show you these cars. I'm going to give you three examples. I'll show you all the pictures. And I believe each one of them is moderate to severe hit. Let's see what got deployed. Let's see. But I'll be honest with you. Uh, if they didn't get deployed and the crash sensor's right there, what's the first thing we're going to disconnect before we start welding and pulling it and, and um, going in the shop and running it around the back and going over potholes and stuff? What are we going to disconnect? The crash sensors. Well, the battery, yes. But if we want to drive the car and bring it up a ramp, a lot of these uh, frame machines you've got to drive up a 45 degree ramp. Disconnecting the battery is what you want. Arm and disarm, it's the most important thing. But again, just realize those crash sensors are too sensitive. If we're going to drive the car around the building, we don't want to push it. We've got to bring it up on, a, um, on the, an old style uh, frame machine where it doesn't come down on the floor, it doesn't tilt. Then we just got to make sure that no jarring sets all those airbags off. Because the adjuster's already been there. Is there any, is there any deployment? No, but all of a sudden you call them up two days later, you're looking for a dashboard, headliners, and body panels. There's going to be a problem, or possible glass. There's going, to be a, there's going to be a big problem. All right, and that, again, that's for me. That's my determination, what I've been seeing, and I see a lot of cars. 
Uh, key safety, just a couple of new technologies. Key safety and Ford Motor Company designed and developed rear seatbelt airbags, which we talked about. They're going to debut in 2011. They go into production in 2010. Well, I, I believe I read during all my research, Mercedes already has this out. One of the at first class I had in Auburn, Mass. The gentleman was sitting. A good friend of mine is a Mercedes tech, and they're out. They're out. They're on the Mercedes. Um, the last year or so, rear curtain airbags. Toyota next year, they're doing it in Japan first. If there's a rear collision, and the people are in the back seat, and there's a rear collision, they use a curtain airbag that comes down and protects all the passengers in the rear seat, their heads. It goes around the headrest and everything. Can there be flying debris, glass and whatnot from the car that got impacted? How about, could there be parts flying off the car that it impacted with? So it protects, they're trying it out. Um, again, they got very small cars in uh, Japan, so we're going to see how that works before we bring it over here and let a Hummer run into the back of it, like John Anello's truck. <clears throat> Probably run over the thing and flatten it. Then they'll have to have come up with a roof airbag that inflates. But um, 2009 Ford F-Series pickup, I got a 2009, a lot of new technology. They came out with a patented K-bag. It's dual chambered. One part comes down and protects your lower torso. The other one comes up and protects your rib cage. Because what happens is, if we have a frontal impact, how much area do we have between the bumper and the steering wheel? Or between us? We got a little bit of distance. What's the proximity between the occupant and the driver's door? That door can contact them, the B pillar can talk to, contact them, or the other vehicle can it pierce the door. It can pierce the door real quickly. Right now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, side airbags deploy faster than the front ones. Why do they deploy faster? Less protection. Less protection, exactly. We're too close to the side. And if we have side airbags, are the days of laying on the passing out and whatnot, against, letting the kids lean up against the seats and lean up against the doors, hanging off the seats. We can't do that. If their head is in the first, what inches? Two to three inches, that's the what zone? The wrist zone. They need to be away from that. They need to be away from that. Um, safety precautions. I just threw a bunch of them up here. I didn't put the model years or the models for a reason. I want you the most thing I want you to do is the most to be the most cautious. I want you to locate the OEM disarming and rearming procedure before attempting any diagnosis on the vehicle. I want you to look at you want to find it. I just did some averages. General Motors, one minute. Ford vehicles, one minute. Chrysler vehicles, two minutes. Toyota, three minutes. Honda, three minutes. We're going to, it's for the reserve backup power. If we got a frontal impact and we, dis, we, we lose the source voltage from the battery, we got a front impact, it's bad, it's crashed, we break the battery cables. What's the chance a second later somebody could hit us from the side? That module has to still be alive and be able to make commands and be able to give out a charge of how much voltage or current current to deploy the airbag to keep you safe. So if we lose source voltage from the battery to the airbag, the airbag's got some capacitors in. I'm gonna pass a few around right here. You'll actually see I took these apart during class for a class. But you'll actually see here's a Ford. You'll actually see the capacitors in there. <clears throat> and we'll have to we have to depower, we have to dissipate those capacitors. Otherwise, if we keep a charge in there, can we disconnect the battery? If we don't wait, are those capacitors still charged up? Can they any time send current down and deploy an, an airbag? Yeah, and somebody could get seriously hurt. Somebody could get seriously hurt. So again, I didn't put the model years and stuff in there. I just wanted to give you an idea how the times change. Me, I like to wait five minutes. I'll go and I'll disarm the car and I'll go and get my equipment. That's a good five minutes. Then I know I'm really safe. Can, it, can one model year be three minutes and the next model year be five? Sure. Anything's possible, so I just always want everybody to be safe. I want to, uh, inputs, uh, we have battery, communication, seat belt buckles, again, brought it up at the beginning of class, very important. Passenger side, shut off switches, if equipped, will this be on? A pickup truck. Sports car with no backseat. Passenger side occupant detection system, if equipped. We got a lot of trucks out there, the larger trucks. We might have airbags in the car, 3500s or whatnot, dump trucks and, you know, the, so smaller dump trucks. But they may not have a passenger presence system on them. 
uh, vehicle speed sensor signals, frontal crash sensors, side impact sensors, if equipped, accelerometer, accelerometer sensor. I'm going to send one of those around uh, in the, when I do the control units in a couple minutes. Um, again, uh, that can be an integrated control circuit or it can be the ball going up a ramp. Ball held in place, a magnetic field. But when they have this stuff, a lot of the control units have a direction on it. There's an arrow. We have to face them towards the front of the car. We have to do that for a reason. Rollover sensors, if equipped. Can anybody, that's a, quite a few inputs. Can you think of any else? <clears throat> Outputs, warning indicator. What is Toyota and Lexus having a problem with right now? It closes the gate, puts the warning light on if we got a code, and they can't release it. It can't release it. It's a common problem. I showed you a module. So just understand, the warning indicator, we complete the ground on most cases. Positive safety cables, we're going to get involved with that. That's a, uh, a pyrotechnic device as well. Seatbelt pretensioners, driver's side steering wheel, dual stage, single stage. Knee bolster airbags if it's equipped. Some vehicles just have knee bolsters themselves. It's just a mechanical device. Uh, Passenger side dashboard airbag module, curtain airbag modules. Somebody, uh, Ford calls them canopy uh, airbags. Seat cushion side airbag modules, door airbag. Again, a lot of them, they're equipped. There is a lot more outputs than that. There's a few more outputs than that. Okay, uh, the sensors themselves, external sensors. We get front, side, roll over, or seat position. Seat position is a big thing right now. Internal sensors, we can have an accelerometer or a safing sensor. Electrical, be careful when probing the vehicle's electric systems. Back early days, everything was in a plastic conduit. What was the color? What was the color of the connector? I don't see that anymore. I haven't seen that in years. The connectors can be black, orange, gray. <clears throat> I don't see up around, unless it's up around the clock, but I'm not saying every manufacturer. General Motors, I've got a 2002 uh, steering column you've seen a little bit. It's got a plastic conduit to the bottom. The volos, everything else I see, will have the connector, it goes into the main wiring harness. And the main wiring harness for the steering column goes right down the shaft. Could that get us some trouble later on if somebody's putting aftermarket devices in? It always should have been separate. It's not anymore. Just understand, you look at, I was in a Volvo one day to do my waveform library. I go around a lot of the shops on Saturdays and I want to make the library bigger and bigger and bigger. So I keep adding, I get in a Volvo. <clears throat> Every connector on that steering column, everything, every multi-junction box was yellow. Everything was yellow. So what you couldn't even tell was where the wire ended and connected to the new one. Everything was yellow. So I actually take all the covers down right up to the clock spring. I get up to the clock spring, it's orange. I get to the other side of the airbag, it's orange. Now, <clears throat> originally, originally, I'm going to be honest with you right now, Back in, I'm an old guy. Back in our day, when I started out, I was in the dealers in 1976, 78, and uh, as early as that. And then I started doing full time later than that. But um, we, they originally determined there was a life expectancy on this stuff. And, Volvo, and then they realized it's lifetime. Volvo, right now, if you go up to a 2000, 2001 car, 99 Volvo, look on the B pillar. Look where the safety latch is. There's going to be a sticker. And on that sticker says SRS warning. This system is, is meant to, is, it, it needs to be rechecked for proper operation in 10 years. And that sticker's right on the door. They put a date on it from the production date when they want that system rechecked again. But even with Volvo right now, everything's lifetime. And lifetime, does it mean the life of the car? No. No. <clears throat> if you're from Massachusetts, dude, that could be yearly. Don't worry about these airbag pods getting stale. We change them all the time. We, we cut people off. We don't use turn signals. That's why the bulbs last forever. We come out of, we, we come out of um, a stop sign like we're coming out of a launch tube. Dude, it's, like, it's the greatest thing. You're going to do brakes, but no bulbs. Okay, so just understand. Uh, just understand, we may not see the yellow conduit that you're familiar with seeing. It could go right up to the main harness, and the connectors themselves can be different colors. Shorting bars. Everything has shorting bars. The harnesses will have them in multiple places. We'll have, um, I'm going to pass around, uh, when you disconnect an inflator, I keep a box of these. 
Every time you guys get a clock spring or, or an airbag where it has the connectors go, cut them off, stick them in here. Because when we do our testing, we could just go in here really quickly, grab one of these, put the connector on the back of the inflated device, one or two, and we can open up the shorting bars and we can finish our test. I'm going to send around real quickly uh, a bag here. I want you to look at the bag. Matter of fact, you'll see one of the connectors and it is not yellow. But I wanted to show this for a reason. There's a bunch of different kind of shorting bars in here. But every time we disconnect a pretension or an airbag, or a lot of the harness connections in an airbag, there's shorting bars. The shorting bars connect the two circuits together. So, so what we do is, if there was ever a charge, can it affect anything? No, the voltage I and mean, the charge can't go anywhere. It can't deploy anything. So once we disconnect the airbag, we short the two terminals together, we're making this, it's like a redundant safety. We're making it safe. But you can get multiple connectors like that all the way through the cars. Uh, bridge resistors are used on vehicles when the SRS uh, wiring circuits are present, but the vehicle is not equipped with a specific inflator module. You'll find these on later Fords, for example. It could have the wiring for a side airbag but there's no airbag. But it doesn't mean, the only reason I brought this up, it doesn't mean if it's 2.4 ohms resistance or 3 ohms resistance for that side airbag, that doesn't mean that's what the resistor is using. The car may be using a 10,000 ohm resistor. So if we try to bypass that, create an open circuit or whatnot, we're going to set a code. If I try to take the resistor out thinking it's bad, and I put a, and it's more of a module configuration problem, and I throw a load device in there or a simulator, it may not do anything to the code because my load device is equal to the airbag or the inflator. But the car may have one that's much greater or much less. Much greater or much less. I gotta get a clicker. Actually, I gotta put a thing around my neck. <clears throat> you should be able to clap these things. One thing I do know is when they fall on the floor, I usually can find the pieces. But that's why I brought it up. Uh, the only earbag I have on here, earbag system, I took it out of my service van. Even though I bought a lot of earbags for, for the show for um, displays, and I set a bunch of them off. Uh, the earlier one on the e, uh, E250 van, if it didn't, was not equipped with a side earbag, they literally took a wire and they grounded it to the frame. And that was enough to say it didn't have a side earbag. It took it out of what the SRS would look at. Inside that bag, this is the most common one we see, that I see a lot of. When we put the connector back in, this is spring-loaded up against both terminals. Is that circuit now shorted? It is. That's a safety device. If I stick the connector in there, what am I going to do to these spring-loaded contacts? I'm going to bring them together, and it's now going to be a, a full working circuit again. So this just happens to see I can pass. Any of these earbags you'll see, there's one built inside. The bag that's going around, I got a single stage earbag. Here's the shorting bar, and it's meant to be clipped to the metal bracket. This side here could be for the Han. Up here, <clears throat> this is a Volkswagen, orange connector, blue inside, blue inside, and then we use a white uh, uh, little wedge. You gotta put the white wedge in here. And once we disconnect it, those shorting bars come together. Or then we have the spring-loaded ones right here. And you'll see a lot of the spring-loaded ones. So there's three different kinds it can be. I just broke up that connector a little bit better, cut this one open so you can visualize it. Uh, some manufacturers do not authorize replacement of the electrical terminals themselves. I was talking to Pia the other day during class. I encourage a lot of... Um, you know, feedback, a little, a lot of, um, you know, I want to hear what you guys have to say. And uh, Pia came in a few times and, you know, I, I, I mentioned to him that I've done some repairs. I ran the whole, I had the shop run the wire from the, from the positive cable all the way up to the, to the SRS module just to find out the terminal at the end of the cable doesn't fit in the module. So I asked him, you know, Pia during class, I mean, he's my BMW guru. And he'll tell you that they want the whole, they want the whole harness replaced. And when the BMWs go out, they create a lot of heat because we got current going through them that will melt some of the circuits. But, the, you know, I, I haven't seen that yet, to be honest with you. But the thing is, um, uh, I know it can happen, and now I'm more of aware it can happen. Um, but itself, if there's a damaged harness from an accident or whatnot, you're buying the harness. Trying to get the connectors, you know, it's not going to happen. Okay, primary straights. Seat belt buckle switch circuit testing. Again, Airbags, lights on. Very common code for an automotive shop. If someone's putting their seatbelt buckle on and off, on and off, on and off, got a car seat, on and off, on and off, 
can it set the, if it's a major input or input to the SRS, can it put the light on? Dude, I, I do about four or five a week, seat belts, okay? And there's a couple ways to do it. I want to show you. Seat belt with the switch. Now, is it an input or output device? Input. It's an input. <clears throat> now, many manufacturers design your seat belt buckle input switch circuit with a simple contact switch. It means we can just put a resistor across it. We can do it, a DVOM across it, check resistance, buckle and unbuckle. But a lot of manufacturers use a Hall effect switch. So we try resistance testing. We need to see change in voltage. If we put resistance second across it, buckle it, unbuckle it, and we buy a seatbelt buckle, and we put it in, and we got the same code, did we correctly diagnose that seat? Did we do the proper testing? <clears throat> we could have voltage, if it's a uh, Hall effect switch, it could be missing the power source going to that switch. Um, so, again, I'm going to just bring up one real quick. 2001 Volvo seatbelt, I'm going to bring up a couple actually. 2001 Volvo seatbelt buckle switch. Again, this is the input I'm after right now, not a pretensioner. I'm just after the input. It wouldn't have the pretension on this anyhow, but I'm after the buckle switch. Okay, I put the terminals on, do a quick connection. I switch the resistance to the, uh, the DVOM and put on resistance. You'll see during this class as well, I use different multimeters. I use four or five different, maybe six different multimeters. Because if a lot of times, if it can't be zeroed out and you're looking at resistance, what are you looking at? Either the leads or the meter, right? <clears throat> so now, switch resistance, buckled or unbuckled, is this a defective switch? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. It may not be a what? Simple contact. It could be a Hall effect switch. Is that the way to test it? No. <clears throat> exactly. Voltage. Let's try that connection again. Voltage of seatbelt switch unbuckled. 12.6. What's 12.6? Battery voltage. Voltage of seatbelt switch buckled. What am I down to? 10.4. That's working properly. That's working properly. What I'd expect not to see any voltage. We have a circuit problem or a switch problem or the voltage doesn't change. <clears throat> okay, 2006, Nisa Murano, seat belts unbuckled. We got an open circuit or infinite resistance, overload. My snap on says ouch on it. Why does it say ouch? Because I paid too much. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just, no snap on guys in the room? Okay. <clears throat> All right, 2006, does it mean it's unbuckled? Now here is it buckled. Is this a defective switch? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. So I want to keep everything real simple. I happen to use a scope instead of DVO. It's going to be a change in voltage. Unbuckled, buckled, unbuckled. And again, I use a scope more than I use the DVOMs. But is that a simple resistance check? Is that a bad switch because we have bad contacts? No. We look at, that's a Hall effect switch. <clears throat> Supplementary restraint system, various components. DVOM does not measure resistance directly. Okay, it, the, v, the DVOM applies a fixed voltage to the circuit. Okay, then it, it, it measures the current flowing through the circuit. The DVOM calculates the resistance using Ohm's law. And we got nowadays, we have high impedance DV, multimeters. Not back in the days when I started with the old analogs. But high impedance, 10 mega ohms, means we get 10,000 ohms resistance, right? It's actually stepping back and it's not. It's not loading the circuit, even though it does load the circuit a little. It's so minuscule, it doesn't affect our readings. But it's, it's not a parallel path. We're actually viewing the circuit. Okay? Um, and it, the old analog days, I really believe, you know, if we're 10,000 mega ohms, there could be meters out there with 100. You know, 100 ohms resistance. Can that be a parallel path? Sure, especially if it's what? less than whatever the resistance is on the main circuit. Voltage is looking for its path to ground, right? Simplest path to ground. Okay. <clears throat> seatbelt buckle, real pretensioners and seatbelt buckle pretensioners. Okay. Seatbelt buckle pretensioners. Is it input or an output? This is the earbag, the deployment. It's the output, okay? Mazda front seatbelt buckle pretensioner. Here's a new one right here. What's the resistance? Can you guys see that? 2.4 ohms. 
The whole idea of showing you these resistance views real quickly as we go over all the different components is basically to show you we're working within the same range. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show you one. I got one that's cut apart when we deployed it. I got a couple of videos that are actually on here, and we've been trying to get them up and going. Um, and I just have a problem downloading them. Me and P have been playing the last couple nights, but when they do the DVD or whatnot, we're gonna, I'm going to make sure they're in there. Um, Here's a 2003 Cadillac STS seatbelt pretensioner. It's a resistance check. I use four multimeters. What's the average ohms? 2-1-2-1-2-2-2-0. What's the average ohms? Two ohms. <clears throat> okay, a couple quick ways we can do it. I like to use a screwdriver. If I don't want, I mean, I can really simply go in a shop and ask the technician to yank out the front seat. He yanks out the front seat, I turn around and I, I put a load device in its place, a simulator per se, but it's resistance. So it's acting like there's a load on the circuit, okay? And what I'll do is I'll put this in its place and I'll see if the code clears. Did it pass the self-test? That's simple and easy to do. I have to have the technician remove the, the seat because I don't do the work physically myself. But the second thing you do real quickly is just take a long screwdriver shaft and put a piece of tape on it. What I want you to do is just pull the cushion back a little. And if you got the style with the ends, usually they're open. Some of them got rubber caps on like you'll see on the board at break. I'll stick this down the shaft and I'll put the piece, I'll mark it with my finger where it went down the shaft or the barrel and I'll put tape there. And now I'll go over to the side to set the code, and if it doesn't go down deep enough, I know it's got what? It's been deployed. Now, some are simple and easy to get deployed. I'm going to pass this around right now. We can see that the piston came all the way down the barrel, and it's got an O-ring here. What's the O-ring for? Traps the gas, right? With a pyrotechnic device. Now, you'll see on that piston, we got two cables. That's what takes up the distance between the occupant and the bag. It made its way down. Depending if the seat, can the seat belt, if it's on this um, pretension on the buckle, can the seat belt ever get caught in the door? Can it be all twisted up? I'll go in there and they're out only about a half inch because the seat belts were caught and they wouldn't fully pull. When these deploy, we use resistance or resistor circuit, a hot wire circuit, or a semi, you know, a semiconductor bridge circuit. We open up that circuit. So even if that came out a half inch, that's me really quickly looking at it. I mean, if we have a console in between, we can say, okay, this one's down three inches. This one isn't. The other one, one side looks like this. The other side looks like this. So right away, we know which one got deployed. What if it doesn't have a console? And what if it only deployed about a half inch? That's not really easy to determine. It's really not easy to determine. <clears throat> That's why I use the barrel of the screwdriver. I use it real quickly. When I determine that it's not a circuit issue, and it is the pretension, which only takes a few minutes to do, I'll have the technician grab the boss, tell the technician, I need the seat out. And they'll pop the seat out. I put it at 45. I remove the connector. I put my simulator tool in. The code's cleared. What do I know? It's an open circuit. But even if I check the pretensioner with a resistance check, what will I see? An open circuit. So there's a couple ways to quickly do it. But a, a screwdriver, simplest, fastest way to do it without taking anything apart. Okay, measuring the plunger depth, stick it in. I put tape on. I always got tape on it. I put tape on it with the edge here. Put it out in a vise. Um, we got a single battery, 1.5. Volt battery is actually 1.6 with the service charge when it's brand new. Two batteries. This is what we use for a power source. We got this down to 800 milliamps. Will not deploy the bag. But 1.6 does. So by the end of this week, I'm going to get the magic number. I just haven't had time. I got to have this in the last class when this is over. The rest of these bags are being deployed. That's called fun time. <clears throat> Honey, you don't want to come within a quarter mile of me. So what did I do to that honey-do list for the weekend? See ya. You know, you don't want to add to that if I'm too close to the house. <clears throat> All right? So, a nine, so basically, we're seeing about 2 to 3 ohms resistance. So if we take 1.6 and just, if we divide it by 2 ohms, what's the amperage? 0.8. It's real quickly to do. I use ohm law every day. In college, I figured I'd never use it. We're going to stick this in the video when we get done. But quickly, voltage is current times resistance. 
Current equals voltage divided by resistance. Resistance equals voltage divided by current. And this is really quickly how to do it. And again, this is in your thing. This is in your, um, in your handout. Uh, again, this is what I wanted you to see. Current does it. This does it. 0.800 milliamps does not deploy it. 1.6 deploys it. You don't need a 9-volt battery. You don't need 2.5, 3 amps to deploy these. It's a real low number. <clears throat> Here is it totally deployed. Now, a little quickly, it pulled down from almost 10 inches down to 6 and 3 quarter. But look at the screwdriver, and this is the point I want to show you. How far did it come out? Even if it only came out a half inch, because let's say the seatbelt got caught in the door or was all wrapped up like this, uh, or maybe the customer wasn't wearing it. Wasn't wearing it. <clears throat> Pre-breaking, it locked up, right? And then it pulled. But the screwdriver is just a quick and easy thing to do without sitting there. And usually the bolts go through the floor, don't they? What's the thread look like on the other side? Yeah, you work at it. You work at it. So really quickly, a screwdriver. Again, we've come a long way. I just don't think we got the strategy and everything the way we want. EVAPs. Do we always have a problem with small uh, leaks? Yeah, because if we generated any vacuum, I mean, excuse me, any vapors in the tank, it could mask a small leak. Most of those cars, if I saw a PO4, let's say, a, uh, excuse me, a PO456 or 442, I could have a small leak in every circuit, purge, vent, tank, I could have a leak everywhere, and it was still a small code, a uh, small leak code. These pretensioners over here, they deployed. Did it pass a self-test on the 98 van? Yeah, well, it'll, when we turn it on tonight, it'll, it'll pass the self-test as well. Those barrels are at the end. Are those open circuits? I got two open circuits. We're going to take, the, I want you to take the rubber plungers and look how far they come out. They're at the end. Those are open circuits. How did it pass the self-test? We've come a long way, but I just don't think we're quite there yet. Why I bring up EVAP? What do we do with EVAPs now? What's the model for testing EVAP leaks? The car shut off. The car shut off. We shut the car off, we let it sit there, and if the pressure rises, which it will, over atmospheric, and then as the temperature outside cools, the pressure in the tank cools, it turns into a vacuum. If it goes above atmospheric and pulls it down below atmospheric, is there a leak in the system? Can't be, because it would equal out atmospheric. So I think <clears throat> where EVAP came up with a new model, I really think they're doing their best job with these SRS, but sometimes you go to the car and you got to figure out, try to figure out why something didn't deploy. You know, and, 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 and then why they deploy way too early or why a simple pothole set them all off. Okay, pretension resistant after deployment. What do we have? <laughs> Open circuit, right? Open circuit. Now, here's a seatbelt reel pretensioner. What, how many ohms we got on it? 2.7. <clears throat> Most of the systems work like this. I'm going to send a couple around real quick. Just shake them. You'll actually feel the balls. There's a pyrotechnic device in here, and there's balls in this style a tube. And what happens is you'll see it upcoming in a couple of pictures when you actually can see a, a real close through. There's actually, on most of these, there's like six paddles. And the balls come out, and they force the paddle backwards. So in other words, say you got six balls here. We ignite it. Now we got eight. Two more come out or the gas is going to push the last one around. And we're going to take the paddle, and we're going to shove it the opposite way. We're going to lock it up. But I just want to show you this. They're basically the similar stage. Uh, you'll hear the noise in there. You'll see the pyrotechnic device. And right here, you'll see the balls. <clears throat> and every time I put the balls back in, or fully deployed, I can't get them all in. So we either got a plunger or a piston that moved, or what? We sent another ball out into the tube. But <clears throat> either way, we're turning the paddle the opposite way. Um, clapper device, dude. Got to get a clapper device. This is a seatbelt tensioner, a uh, pretensioner, a real pretensioner. Same thing. You'll hear it. This is, a, this is they put these in the seats, like a, a 97 Saab SUV. And the biggest problem I see with this, this is in the seat. This is where it's coming out of the seat. And what happens when these deploy, they crush the side of the seat. So when the cars come in, they're more concerned not about doing the body work. See, basically, they can straighten out the seat. Because right now, they get to a point that the customer wants the car looking better than it did when it got in the accident. Don't they? They want you to rebuild that car. 
My body shop guys, to me, are like wizards. I get a young kid, a bunch, I get a couple of shots to a bunch of young kids, and we go in and we harass each other all the time. They're just a great bunch of guys. I got a good relationship with all my guys. I'm spoiled. They really take good care of me, and I take good care of them. And I come in one shop one day, advanced all boy, I says, hey, you know, Oscar, what's going on? He's looking at the pictures on the computer. He goes, see that? Do you know what kind of car it is? And I go, no. He goes, I don't either, but it's supposed to look like that when I'm done. <laughs> and the left front headlight is up against the door. I mean, this thing is crushed, but it has to look like that. Does the paint match? And if there's a squeak or a rattle, are they going to be back? Yes. They've been paying insurance for years and years and years. Now they're going to put it to work. <clears throat> 2.7, again, here's the pretensioners, and the balls go around there. It's like a shotgun shell. The way I say it's like a shotgun shell. Now, you'll actually, if you can see this is a better picture, as far as clarity when I use the flash, you'll see the paddles in here. See them? And you're going to push the paddles with the ball. <clears throat> you're going to push the paddles. Well, we're going to take a locking mechanism, and we're going to make it lock. SRS modules, impact collision sensors. Here's a few of them right here, General Motors, I believe. This is a Volkswagen Audi. That's a Ford. What do a lot of them have on it for? They're directional. They want them face to forward of the vehicle. Now, I'm going to send around right now a Volkswagen Audi one, the one you see in the picture, and I want you to shake it. And you'll feel the accelerometer in here. You'll hear it. And then look at the direction that when it gets in an impact, look where the front of the car is. Now, imagine if we turned it sideways. Would it work properly? No. <clears throat> That's what I thought I'd do. I need more tape. I says, I moved the table and she did such a great job. And I go, I'm going to go down on that anyhow. Because it's a guy thing, you know? Okay, so again, <clears throat> this will make its own internal calculation. It's going to deploy if we have what two um, size, kinds of accident? Moderate and what? Severe. Severe. So we have to get past the calculation. Once it breaks, it goes beyond the calculation, it will deploy the bag. Whether it's a single stage, whether it's a dual stage, it's going to pick what it's going to deploy. And again, <clears throat> if it doesn't think it's moderate, if it doesn't pass that threshold, is it going to deploy anything? No. no. <clears throat> Unless it's getting an incorrect signal. Some of the earlier ones, Ford had a big problem, they're cracking, especially on the trucks. They put them on the, the latch, the frame that goes from the top of the radio support to the bottom, and you'll see a lot. They'll go in there, the, corro the, the corrosion, terminals are all gone, they're all cracked, but the body of the thing was cracked. Nissan, a lot of problem with the Nissan, but here's the old, it's just a different, different few years, different variations, but again, what they do, whether electromagnetic, mechanical, excuse me, or their IC, uh, integrated computer, uh, integrated, integrated control circuit, this is just sending a circuit back. This is sending a signal back, and, you know, and basically the SRS is using that as an input. And it's determining with that signal, with what it's feeling inside as far as the internal sensors, to determination if it's going to go beyond that threshold, or did it reach that threshold. Okay, here's a side impact sensor. It's on the B pillar. There's another yellow connector right here. But is it yellow after that? No, it goes into the main house. What's over here? It's unbolted and laying aside. It's unbolted and it's laying to one side. <clears throat> it's a seatbelt, real pretension. It's a seatbelt, real pretension. But anything with yellow, as far as connected to do with SRS, usually goes to the component itself. But again, can we have a lot of connectors that are orange right now? Do we have a lot of wiring? There's no plastic coating. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, crash detection systems, uh, uh, sensors, electromechanical devices, and the later ones are fully IC circuitry. Clock springs. We'll call them clock springs, module coils, airbag coil windings. We'll call them, they have multiple names, just like the control units. Multiple, multiple names. RCMs, ECMs, SDM, but they still work the same. They're the, what makes the determination if we're going to deploy it or not. Now, what precautions should we use when working on steering columns? What do we got to do to protect that clock spring? Disconnect the battery, but what else? I go to disconnect that from the rack of the box. What do I got to do? Huh? 
<coughs> Dude, the other guy said that. <coughs> no, we did that when we were, what, 16 years old, towing cars. Guy brought in, I go, my God, he's as old as I am. I go, what did you use to tow the car? He said, four by four. How many times did you use two? And I said, what's the first thing you do? We used to wrap the seat belts around. But basically, what I want you to do is make sure you lock the steering wheel. Because that steering, that the, the car is designed where, say, let's go, I'm use an example. Say it goes two and a half turns to the left, two and a half turns to the right. So it's five full turns. Say this clock spring's got enough stretch for three turns. What happens when it goes three and a half? Now, <clears throat> because it's moving parts and it's a connector inside, could we have high resistance through that clock spring? So if that airbag module is two ohms and we have clock spring resistance instead of a, just a pass-through device, we have two or three ohms resistance. Now we're up around four or five ohms and we're outside the range. Can we set a high, resi high resistance circuit code to one of the front deployment loops? Yeah. So that's why I just want to understand. It's not a simple bypass and we just have to protect it. It is a simple bypass. We need to protect it. Uh, battery positive safety cable, but dude, I love hearing that. It's like I can only relate to that. I sit in a class, a drivability class, I go, when I was 16 years old, why did I put unit points in a car? And only older guys can tell me, because I always lost one screw. <laughs> and I did. Two for the points, one for the condenser, guaranteed. And that car, once I dropped it, it was gone. <clears throat> it ate the car. And I was the only shop that I was working at uh, for my father-in-law at the time. And um, I was the only shop on Saturdays that constantly has the unit points. Couldn't get the screws unless you bought a distributor. <clears throat> but the positive safety cables, these are BMW. I, I, I find these on BMWs. If we hit the, as far as down we get to case studies, as far as we get going down on the case study, excuse me, we'll cover a bunch of these. But this is a pyrotechnic device. It sits on the positive cable, and during impact, it'll actually, it'll actually go off, and it'll do a separate the cable from the terminal end right on it. So it's going to shut the power down. It's going to shut the power down. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of problems with those. Um, if they get in an accident, the trigger wires have a connector. They're about a foot away from the battery, from the battery terminal. If that connector gets damaged, those pins won't lock in tight. If they don't lock in tight and they're able to just move back and move back or, or wedge, can they, be create, can they have less of a contact and create what looks like an open circuit? Yeah, the biggest thing is terminal tension with anything. When we have a misfiring cylinder and it's an injector and we pull the injector off and we put it back on and the problem goes away, what do we just do? Make a new contact. Make a new contact. So we have a lot of issues. And I bring this up about terminal tension because, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if I've, got a dual, I've got a seat code, whether it's a pre-tensioner, side airbag, it's got something to do with the occupant sense, uh, uh, detection system, and I get a, a code for an open circuit or whatnot, first thing as I look under the seat, what am I looking for? Trash. I'm looking for bottles. I'm looking for empty bottles and a power seat where somebody put the bottles underneath the floor and they ram the seat back. Now we take the breakout harness that comes out of the floor, we go to the connector to the ABI, AB, I mean AB, SRS, um, apologize, SRS, and it's like a guitar string, it's so tight. Can we be literally pulling those terminals out of the connector? Yeah, so we're losing terminal tension. So when we do get the diagnostics, I want to go step by step. One thing is the visual inspection. And I, I need you, if we have a seat, seat codes, whatever they are, we need to look under that car. I've taken out half a bag of trash one time. Half a bag. I took a kitchen garbage bag. And all the, in America, the people can't believe in Europe and stuff, we drink so much water. We buy water. We don't drink from the faucet at home. There's always got to be a reason because we can buy it for $3.99 a case. <clears throat> I got an 800 foot well and I got more plastic bottles going out in the trash on a weekly basis, I can imagine. <clears throat> okay. Battery positive safety cables. Again, during an accident, it's a pyrotechnic device. It's a pyrotechnic device. This is what I normally see. 2.3 ohms. 2.3 ohms. Is this an input or an output? It's an output. Excellent. Excellent. Here's the trigger right here. Here's the trigger, the two eyes for the trigger. Now, I disconnect that. What am I going to see inside there? What are we seeing in there? Shorting bars. Everything has shorting bars on it. We're going to protect it from once it's disconnected from actually being deployed. Okay. Driver's side steering wheel and passenger side instrument panel airbag modules. Now, here's one off for General Motors. 
It's not uncommon for me to see up to old four cars, old five cars, with still single stages in them. I got Corolla airbags in a box around here. They're old five cars. They're still, still single stage. Old six, I see a lot of what? Dual stage, because we see a lot of smart advanced systems. As of 2006, we got the advanced uh, airbags. What was the year that we had to have them, airbags to begin with? 98. And what about the light trucks? Excellent. Okay, one connected, two pin here, single stage or dual stage? Single. <clears throat> okay. I grabbed a bunch of DVOMs. Again, that's an Aurora. Um, I wanted to see what it is. Hooked it up, made my own terminals. I plugged that in to open up what at the end of that connector? Shorting bar. Excellent. Excellent. Bunch of different meters. Again, you saw I used multiple meters. What's the average ohms? Two. We're still between two and three ohms. Have you seen any five or tens? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Here's my buddy Rick. He does a lot of work. We're really close. He does a lot of work with me. A lot of guys make this class successful. I'll be honest with you. I got him. I got uh, uh, Jeff Clark. He does, he does, he's the one that fabricates my whole truck. Um, I don't let anybody touch the truck except for Jeff. Jeff made the board. Jeff makes boards for all my class. And he's just, matter of fact, when we need weights for the passenger side, we can get into, you'll see what I use for weights, but we can go up to a regular... We can go up to a regular dumbbell set, right? Somebody's throwing out the track. Jeff weighs them. He weighs them. With Toyota, I need exactly 66 pounds. Jeff cut them all down. So they, this is exactly 16 pounds. So when Honda comes up to you and says, put a determined amount of weight on, I know exactly what these things weigh. Jeff, again, he's a talented fabricator. Uh, Pierre's been a big help. He's my BMW guru. <clears throat> He's like twice the pay an hour I am. If you call him, he, you got to pull out a credit card too. <clears throat> Hi, Pierre. But uh, this is Rick O'Neill. He's an auto technician because he couldn't get on the Drake at Bomb Squad. And every time we would deploy, he's like, can we hit it now? Can we hit it now? And it was like, he got bored. I got a camera. I got all the, everything for this class. And he turned around and he got tired after blowing off one every hour. There's out on a metal table. What do you think he wanted to do to the metal table? He wanted everything under the legs. He wanted to see if we could, play, we could clear the COVID in between the buildings. I go, dude, let's put about eight bags on each, on each leg. What do we do when it hits the parking lot and keeps flipping? Dude, we've got to shut the door and turn all the lights off. That sucker ain't stopping. They're going to see a present tomorrow when they come into manufacture. Do you want a new table with bent legs? It's yours for free. It may have went through a plate glass window to get there, but, but he does a lot of work with me. And you know what I lost again? <laughs> My clicker. <clears throat> but again, they, uh, there's a bunch of people that made this class very uh, successful. Good friends of mine. I can't, you know, when you're working on cars and you do like I do, it's the resources. I worked in a deal for 23 years. I was trained to do a certain thing. I get a lot of people that I use, a lot of people use me. And guys, people sitting next to you might have a great, well, everybody knows something. Everybody knows a specialty. And I, I don't sound, I want to sound cocky, but when I say to the class, I'm not, in, in, you know, interested in teaching you guys for four hours. I'm interested in you guys teaching me. I love the feedback. I love to learn. Um, <clears throat> Bernie Thompson, I deal with, I talk to him strictly about electrical circuits all the time. Um, and then Mark Warren, he's a physicist. If you can smoke it or explode it, you've talked to Mark Warren. Because <laughs> he usually do both at the same time. But uh, <clears throat> Mark's a doll. But again, you know, and I call Bernie Sparks, but that's my own reason. But we put the earbag on the, on the table and we actually deployed it. It does deploy faster than it could be. When I'm done testing it, what do I have? Open circuit through the igniter. So do I know if that bag got deployed? Now, is there any hazardous substance left in that airbag? No, if it's a dual stage bag, and we only set off a single stage, what do we need to do? To be safe, I'm gonna tell you, cut the bag off. Then secure it down, and we need to detonate the other side. Do we really need a nine volt battery to do that? No, <clears throat> it takes less current than that. Here's a Volkswagen. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, how many ohms on that? 2.3. I want you guys to be careful because a lot of stuff that's going around is, is live. But here's off of 99. <clears throat> the, shorting bar demo, uh, the shorting bar slide plus there was, was that baggie that went around. Everything orange and blue was Volkswagen. And there was no yellow there at all. 
Even that little wedge that kept the shorting bar together until the connector went in, kept them firmly together, was what? Was white. There was no yellow there whatsoever. Okay, here's the one connector. Now, there's a shadow right here. There's not four wires. There's only two. I apologize for that. So, we've got a connector in the back, and regardless if you see four wires, you see a shadow of two. It's my flash. There's two wires going to that. Is that a single stage or a dual stage? Single. single. Is it input or output? Uh, excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Passenger side instrument panel airbag. Single or dual stage. Left side, there's a yellow connector. Right side, there's a green connector. How many stages? Two. <clears throat> okay. All right. This is another thing that, uh, there's actually a video on this, but I kept the stills in here because I wanted you to see this. I had a front clip. A lot of my body shops will realize when I'm doing a class, they'll ask me, what kind of class are you doing? And I'll say, I'm, I'm doing an airbag class. I want to have it ready for about six months. He goes, Dave, I got a 2002 Chrysler out there with a clip. A clip is the front. They, they bought the front nose. They use the fenders, the, door, I mean, the hood, the bumpers, whatever, hood brackets, but then they have the clip. They said, Dave, we got one. Do you want to set the bags up before we put it to the junkyard? I said, yes. But I wanted to try something. So I said to Ricky, a good friend Ricky at Dick's Auto Boy, I said, hey, Ricky, is that thing in the sun yet? And he said, no. He said, in about another 10 or 15 minutes, that whole pen will be lit up and be in the sun. I said, good. I'll be down in an hour. I want that to sit in the sun for an hour. And then I want to come down, test the bags, and I want to deploy them. Just to see what I get for a reading. I'm looking for temperature reading. DVOM does what? It, it does what? It applies a small voltage, it sends a, checks, measures the current, and determines the resistance all by the DVOM internal circuitry because it uses what? Ohm's law. Okay, I got three multimeters. Here's the front clip. I even went up to the driver's side. I went right to the clock spring. 2.4 ohms, I'll average about 2.4 on the uh, passenger side module, driver's side, average about three and a half ohms. So we're still in that two to three range, aren't we? Okay, video deployment, I, I'll have that in the clip. I went to touch these earbags. They were too hot to touch. They were too hot to touch. I was actually burning my hand. This bag went off afterwards. I wanted this thing sitting out in the sun with fresh air going around it. Let me ask you something. That, these bags were 160 degrees. Not the pyrotechnic. The bag itself was 160 degrees. Does the cars that you work on, do they park, do they, people park them out in the parking lot in the sun? Can they sit there all day? We get in the car, the first thing we do is we turn the air conditioning on. We're conditioning the air inside the car. Are we cooling the parts right down? No, I can touch the dash 10 minutes later. What do I do? I'll burn my hand. So what if we leave that parking lot, we get the air conditioning on, we leave the parking lot, five minutes down the street we get in an accident. If those de bags deploy and the heat substance, we, we're, heat, we're heating up a substance, a flammable substance, explosive substance, we're going to create heat. But can the bags by themselves, when they get deployed, can we generate enough heat that they can hot, that they can burn you? People complain about having their hands on the steering wheel, and when do they get burned? On their forearms, or they get burned on their face. 160 degrees, I hope no one's got Botox. Their face is going to be down like this, right? <laughs> like a, a wax face, it's going to melt. But again, the video says during the video, I go touch them, you see my hands, I can't touch the bags, they're hot. Now, my new service van I bought about three years ago. Guys that know me, I took Louis Ruiz for a ride one time and down in MEA. Uh, he's from MEA, from New Jersey. And I brought him down and, and I wanted to, you know, he was going to train me in the morning. Louis is a great guy and he's a great trainer. And I was outside Staples and I had my truck running. And we, so we were sitting inside and he's talking to Scale on the phone. He goes, dude, it's running and we can't see it. So I go, who are you talking to? Scala. He goes, I told him your van was running outside. I wouldn't park in New Jersey unless I could chain the thing to the ground. I get down, he goes, you can't even see it. He goes, dude, didn't lock the doors. Tell Dave I lost the keys. I did. I lost the keys about eight years earlier. And I kept changing the cylinders and what they were. They were frozen. Well, guys know, even with the new van, I never shut it off. I got all these factory scan tools. I got all these scopes. I go, what's it do to the screen if they're too hot? They go black. What happens if they're too cold? They go black. So what I did is I pulled up in this van 
It took me an hour to get there. I didn't shut it off. This van is fully air conditioned. So, we detonated it off. Do we need a 9 volt battery? Do we need 3 amps to set this off? 2.5, 3 amps? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Here's the resistance. It's actually using a 9 volt battery on the driver's side, 2.57 amps. On the passenger side, 3.75 amps. Do we need that much amperage? No, I've proven we didn't. It doesn't take less than that. Now, there's a lot of powder on this thermometer. If there's a lot of powder, what's in those bags for a lubricant? Cornstarch and talcum powder. It's 160 degrees. <clears throat> I put in my van. My van's been running for at least an hour, right? I put in my van. 30 minutes later, this mom is wrapped around the bag only. Not, it's about maybe eight or nine inches away from the pyrotechnic device. What's the temperature on that? 115 degrees. 115 degrees, and it's been in my van, and my van is probably, let's say it's 90 degrees that day. My van's probably 50 degrees. Did it cool down any faster? The ones that you saw me deploy on that table was in a rainy day. That bag deployed after sitting out in the rain. So I said, look it, I want to leave that out there for an hour. And it was a pretty cool, brisk day. And I have to say, the average temperature about 40 degrees. Massachusetts was probably 35 that day. I didn't see any snow on the ground, so it wasn't snowing yet. And it was rainy. I deployed that airbag. Is that the opposite of leaving it in the sun? Yeah, 115 degrees, the bag by itself. That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. Can you see why when we went to the rear seat airbags, we use cold compressed gas? Because what can't we do? Put, we, what, what don't we want to do against the human body? Put heat there. Put heat there. All right. Steering column safety components. Now, steering column since day one, since I, let's say it's my day one, they've always been collapsible. They've always been collapsible. One of the first jobs I started when I was at the dealership when I was a young kid, and again, that was a long time ago, we still had hard rubber tires and spoke wheels. <clears throat> I brought the third or fourth car I got in, the horn wouldn't stop going off. I was talking to uh, Richie about this before uh, break, before uh, class started. And, the horn was keep going off, and it got in an accident. Well, it, I didn't know it got in an accident yet. Nobody knew it got in an accident. We didn't hear about that. Cars are a year old, it's under warranty. The horn's going off. And I'm looking, I'm looking, and I go, e the steering wheel's right up against the, right up against the, um, the plastic. And I'm, God, you can hear this thing crunching. Why? So I disconnect the horn, disconnect the ground. It's still going off. So it doesn't need the wire for me to complete the circuit from the pad to the shaft. It's already shorted. That wire is shorted to the shaft. So I go, what's going on with this thing? So I'm looking and looking at it. I said, geez, I can hear all this crushing. Let me do something. And I put my foot on the brake, and I grabbed the steering wheel, and I yanked it. I yanked it up about a half an inch. That's probably exaggerated. I yanked it up about three-eighths of an inch. I popped it up. The horn went off. So I go, that is strange. And I put my weight on it and I shoved it back down. The horn went off. Up, down, up, down. So I turn around and I said, the foreman comes over and he goes, is it a loose wire or whatnot? I go, dude, we got more into it than that. Let me, I got to take this apart. Well, I'll take the whole car apart. I said, I need to take this apart. So I get in the dash, I pull it apart, tear everything down. There's three pieces of metal that look like long feeler gauges. And it's, it's holding the out, outer jacket to the inner jacket away from each other. When the gentleman got in an accident, his full body weight went against the steering wheel. He, it sprung him up. So now it's just, it's just like an accordion. So I go up to the shop foreman and I said, hey dude, I think this thing's been in an accident. It's been in an accident. That's the only thing I can think of. Or someone tried to steal it and they used an aggressive amount of weight on this, force on this. Can we talk to the customer? He goes, that doesn't make no sense. I says, I'm telling you, ask the guy if the car's been in an accident. You come with me. So we see the guy inside. He's about 300 pounds. He looks like a linebacker for the Patriots. And I said, dude, can I ask you a quick question? He said, yeah, what's up? I go, is this car been in an accident recently? He said, yeah, a couple days ago. How did you know? I said, no, it hasn't been. When did the problem start? He goes, right after the accident. I said, did you, come, did you come, make contact with that steering wheel? He goes, I was shoved right against it. I said, the steering wheel is meant to collapse. And now that it's collapsed, the horn's shorting out to the, to the jacket, and it's always on. So I said, we need a new steering column, and we need to contact your insurance company. So the foreman walked away, and he goes, dude, i got to see this thing. I've never seen this. I go, I've never seen it either. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to tell you why I can't stop the horn from going off unless I put my foot in the pedal and yank the steering wheel. And I'm like, who the heck leaned on it? Well, when they try to take a steering wheel off, 
A lot of guys don't use pillars, right? They put the nut back on the shaft, they pull the thing and they give it a few whacks in the middle. I came in one day and the guy miles having an air hammer digging up tire. He's beating the living heck out of this thing. So I turn around and I go, dude, I don't think I got a thread insert that big. And he spent more time filing it. And you know that, that the steering wheel didn't come off. So it was amazing. But <clears throat> they're all meant to deploy. They're all meant to deploy. And this is important. This is going to bring the airbags up right now. Right here, here's a General Motors. We'll, we'll, there's, a, there's a measurement between the outer jacket and the inner jacket. And it has to be so many inches. If it's not, it collapsed. Now, when we put a steering column up real quick, we're under the dash, we drop it, do dash work or whatnot. We're taking the nut and we're fastening them against what? Like an aluminum slot, right? Like an aluminum spacer. Does that spacer move? Yes, it does. It's meant to collapse. Now, let's take it one step further. I work on brand new cars. This is in 07. This is about three years ago. I was working. Cars got 5,000 miles. Got an in front pack. It got an impact in the front. They worked in the car and they said, Dave, we can't put the SRS light off. We got, because <clears throat> I can talk. I'm so psyched about this. I can keep it going all night. This is 07. A lot of body shops still have a list of what they need to change if there's a deployment. So it came up, and on my scan tool, it said driver's loop, driver's deployment loop, number three open it's an 07 so it's got dual stage so that's driver's deployment loop one and two where's three they put the module and they put everything in clock spring everything they got the same thing i go dude there's something else in here and it's in the driver that doesn't say cd airbag it doesn't say sab on it, it says driver's deployment loop <clears throat> ford and it wasn't even we had to call the dealership and say Trust us, we need you to send me the steering shaft. This is a pyrotechnic device. This steering shaft will give. And now the steering shaft will really give. This allows the steering shaft to give. There's a connector right in here. This connector to see this thing, you're going to have to literally put your head up against the seat pedals and look back. And we were talking about that, me and uh, Richie before class. This is a beer to get off. But I get the connector off, I hold it in my hand, this has a resistance reading, right? If it's got an igniter circuit, it has some sort of a semiconductor bridge, or it's got a high wire circuit, but either way, it's got resistance. I put a load tool in it, and the problem's gone. I can have the technician take it out, and you'll see when I pass around right now, it moved about an inch and a half. And it made the steering column now be able to, what? Collapse, collapse even further. But this is a beer to get to. Just understand, I want you to read the thing, I want you to read the DTC, and not that I'm a guy that believes in DTCs. I'll be honest with you, 50% of the DTCs I work on drivability don't apply to the car, or don't apply to the problem they found in the car. But SRS did pretty on the money. I haven't seen one that sent me down a bad road yet. I don't use flow charts, so when I go look up the DTC, I want to see the conditions to set the DTC. That's why I don't worry about the numbers and whatnot. The SRS module did not see the resistance of a certain component during a self-test. Now, this is the deployment three. Did that stick out a little? Driver's deployment loop number three. There had to be something else on the driver's side. There had to be, and it was that. And again, you really got to get under the dash. And you've got to put your hands on the seat, and you look at your light, and the wires do come down from the back. And I don't even believe they are, they, they're yellow. They could be. It's been a while. But this was in 07. This wasn't in the crash catalog. This wasn't in the information. This wasn't in anything I could find, any of my electronic or my regular, uh, you know, uh, all data, Mitchell, or whatnot. It wasn't in the book yet. So I said, tell the dealer we need the pretension for the steering shaft, because I don't know what you're talking about. We need the steering column. Can we get the upper section? Yes. The only thing is the, the customer was waiting for the car. I really wanted to measure the resistance of the igniter circuit. Peel off to their siblings. Okay? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's the only thing I can say. Okay. This is an 07 Subaru front impact collision damage. It contacted the next car. It was doing 50 miles an hour. And it contacted the next car. Do you think that's moderate to severe? <clears throat> no, but I make this. I'm a serious question. Moderate. Let's say moderate to severe. I'm just. I want to hear your reply. I know my thought. <clears throat> okay. Now, 
See this little yellow conduit right here? A little piece of yellow, you little piece of yellow. I don't know if you can see that. You probably don't have black, you're black and white, but that's a impact sensor. Right here, there's a section of this bumper. It's got the piece of the other car embedded in it. What this car has done, this collision, has bent the frame that that collision sensor sits on. It crushed all the radiators, it snapped all the cylinders off the valve, valve timing, variable valve timing, and cracked the variable valve timing case. Okay? <clears throat> Here's the crash sensor. The frame is bent right here. Now, should it have picked up a vibration or a collision? Or an impact? A vibration or, or a shock? It should have picked it up. It, went, it hit the front of it and went over the top of it. It had to send some signal to the SRS module, and the module, what is suppression? Suppression means what? The SRS module has done what? Under, it, nothing's being deployed. And then if it's single stage, it's what? It's what kind of severity? It's a moderate. If it's a dual stage, if it wants to deploy both airbags, what do we have? A severe. Okay, let's jump inside the car for a minute. And again, everything's crushed in this car. To get the fact that it's New York, we're not going to hold it against the car. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Let me ask you. Did any modules deploy? No. What do you see with the driver? What do you see with the passenger? No. Nothing went off. Let's take another step. Did any SRS modules deploy? What about the seat reels? I can pull the seat out and I can flex the, the belt. And I check the pretensioners too. But these are built into the seat belt. The seat belt reel. I flip this back and forth, the belts aren't locked. There's no SRS light on this car. It does a self-test and passes. So are there any open circuits in this car? 98, we obviously had some kind of strategy problem. Two open circuits, I passed a what? A self-test. And I know they were deployed. I was sitting on the belt for six months. They were in front of me. Where were they? Behind me. For 250,000 road miles, for 100,000 hours of idling, what wasn't on on my van? The airbag light. Okay, these module, these the seat pretensioners did not ignite. They did not deploy. I don't want to use ignite. That's the drivers. Here's the passenger. Any problem? Side airbag. Does that look deployed? Again, I will tell you right now. The light comes on and clears. <clears throat> Okay, do you think something should have um, deployed? I believe so. I believe so. But I'm telling you right now, before this car, if we can't disconnect the battery like this gentleman says, which is the way to do it, and where we're going to find it, the OEM, because it can change from one vehicle to another, one mile to another in the same year. Possibly. Can it change from year to year? Can one crisis say three minutes and the next year say five? We need to look it up. We need to be safe. It only takes a couple of minutes to be safe. I believe something should have went off. If we can't disconnect the battery, which they don't want to, because they got to get it up um, uh, a frame machine, they want to bring it around the back to the, the paint booth and whatnot, what am I going to make sure they disconnect? The crash sensors. Could they be too sensitive now? Yes. The adjuster's already seen this car. He gave him whatever he wanted. Guys from New York, we'll just fix it. Uh, Yankee fan. And um, we'll put it in there, but you, how are you going to tell them that we hit a pothole or we went up the frame machine or we gave it a pull and now we need a curtain, we got the curtain airbags went off, the seat belts went off, we need a headliner, we possibly need some plastic panels. What, what's going to happen? He's going to say, dude, I was just there, what did you do, right? So I'm just want, I want you to be safe. Understand, they can be a lot more sensitive. Impact collision number two. Did the SRS system work as designed? I think we have a long way to go. Me personally, I think we have a long way to go. But that's only my opinion. Now, I do about two or three hybrids a week. And what I do is, I, most of the ones I work on, is I disable them. If the front ties are turning in the same direction, what are we creating in that motor? Voltage. AC voltage. We're creating a huge magnetic field. Like, not like an ejector or a coil, which we are creating a magnetic field, when we shut the power off, well, excuse me, we open the ground circuit, what happens to the magnetic field? 
It collapses. These motors are real large and they've got large windings. Can we have a large magnetic field? If the relays are get activated by the auxiliary battery, and let's say they're a quarter of a volt apart, is there a chance that we could have a voltage spike? Possibly could have jumped those points. And where is it looking to go? It's looking to go to ground. The wires for this car, the motor wires are fine. Every wire that comes out of that inverter is either crushed, damaged, or the terminals are exposed. If he pulls this up the ramp truck and this hood bounces, it sparks. Okay, oh, the, the guy saw this, the adjuster, said get Dave out here, get your guy out here. I want to make this car safe. We're not going to repair it. It is going to the auction. It's going to go to the insurance auction yard. It'll be auctioned off. It says, danger warning, high voltage wires exposed, don't touch without lineman's gloves. Now, the motor is broken. The intake is ripped right off, the motor's cracked. The, the transmission, the CVT, and the inverter are shoved under the dash. He hit this thing about 40 to 50 miles an hour. There was a person in the driver's seat in this car. They have a crash sensor on the side of this hybrid right here to detect a collision. The power works. I took the seat out, I went to put my hands, got a smart key, I felt, I heard the chirp, I opened the door, I got in. This car's live. <coughs> this car's live. It's sitting in the living and it's live. Get pretty well wrecked, right? Okay. Did any modules get deployed? Do you think that's a moderate crash, enough to crack the engine in half, break the intake off, and take the CVT and jam it that I can't get the cover off without prying the front off, which I did. And I isolated, I pulled down, and I isolated the motor windings. And they're AC voltage, right? And I pulled them down out of the inverter, and I taped them all up. And then I put them back up in the inverter, I moved the tabs out of the way, and they're totally isolated. So at least it'll go up a ramp truck. I told the guy, you want to be totally safe with this car? And it's a hybrid, if the wheels are turning the same way, it generates electricity, what should we be using? Dollies. dollies. They're like $79 each or a pair. I tell my boy shops this day, get the dollies. Can we use them other than a hybrid car? Really? Yeah, get them, you know. Do you see anything wrong with the steering wheel? Anything wrong with the passenger side? I don't know if there was a passenger, but definitely the guy was driving, and it was a 40 to 55 mile, 45 to 55 mile an hour crash. Okay, I can take the seat belts and go like this with them. These are the pretensioners are in the reels. I can move them, and I said, just for heck of it, I know the light doesn't come on, but let me check the seat belts. And it was that one in the picture that said, how many ohms? 2.4 ohms. That was from this car. And I go, dude, he goes, Dave, you want to check it? And check it. I said, I want to check these seat belts. I want you to see if there's high resistance, low resistance. No, 2.4. 2.4, is that what we've been seeing? Yeah. Okay. Curtain side airbags, do they go off? Did that panel pop off? No, there's just... <clears throat> what do you think? Do you think that's a moderate crash? This stuff keeps me up at night. I need to know. But we got, a, we got a sensor that gave us a reading for the front. Now realize that the control module itself makes the calculations. I can go in two same year cars. I think it was a Jeep and a, and a van, same year, but it's Chrysler vehicle. One will use crash sensors and one won't. How can you test the crash sensor? You can't. You cannot. If we put a resistance text on it, you're going to get 6 million or 13 million ohms. There's no way to test it. It has to do a self-test. However, if I put a scope on it, I can see it doing a, a test on itself. I can see one that doesn't work, I'll have straight lines. And then I'll have one that works, and I'll, but I don't think we'll get into the laboratory. I mean, when I get through the last uh, slide of the first case study, when we get through the case study, just remind me, I want to hit that. I got a waveform library. I want to flip it through. It'll take me two seconds. I won't stop anywhere, but I want to show you what a seatbelt looks like. I want to show you what, if I don't see that, now I'm making a good waveform library. Every time I have a bad one, I put a bad one in there too. This is bad. I got good powers and good grounds. I got good commu communication to the module. If I got good communication to the module, I got good powers and grounds, could that module be working and my scan tool can't talk to it?
Yeah, but could I have the scan tool that should be able to talk to it? It's got good bowers, good grounds, but it's dead, inoperable. Yeah, I'll check the two, the two signals that are going to the crash sensor. If they're sitting at zero volts, this thing's down. And that lights off. But what I'm saying is, if you don't know the, the, the ability of equipment, I did a Volvo one day, and I want to bring this up, because we won't hit all the case studies tonight. I did a Volvo. I came to the shop. The battery was dead. I plugged it in. The airbag system on a can vehicle is on medium can. It's not on high can. On the data communicate, it's on medium can. I get in the car. I go to pick it up. And I know what a Volvo... I've got to, I can't just go in the SRS module and clear the codes. I've got to go in the central electronic module and clear the codes. And they'll put the seatbelt buckle lights out. It'll, it'll put, once those codes are erased in the central module, it'll, shut, it'll get rid of the, the codes, that, codes that I've been trying to clear, the DTC, which are uh, voltage threshold failures, uh, self-test, and I can clear those codes. I go in there. i got my scan tool in my hand. I got the, it, it works on all my Volvos. It's specifically for my Volvos. And I feel it buzzing. Have you ever had a scan tool buzz? I've never either. I've been doing this a long, I'm an old guy. I go, dude, what did you just do? Oh, the battery's dead. So I put the charger on. What did you put it on? I put it on start. 400 amps. It took out my candy module, which is the can communication data line. I can't talk to that airbag module, but I can't talk to everything else on, that, on the medium speed can. Is it the vehicle or is it me? Is it my equipment? How can I really check it real quick? Check the powers and the grounds and I check for communication. If I check for powers and grounds and the communication is good going to it, but, and I can communicate with every other module on that can medium speed, does that module work? No, but if I can't talk to any of those modules on that data circuit, I'm not going to quickly condemn that. Now I go to the pat. I went to the earbags. I got good signals, dude. We're going to stop right here. Something's going on with my tool. I got to check it on another car. So I come back and I says it's going to be a couple weeks. This car rush? Nope. Not. It's going to sit there for a couple weeks. I got to send out my scan tool. He said because you had it plugged into the low. He says. Did you have a voltage surge? I go, I want to go into it. He goes, I'll tell you what kind of car it was plugged into. Go ahead. It was a Volvo and he named what it is. He goes, what happened? I said, dude turned on the battery charger and he put it on start. It was like 400 amps. I said, the thing buzzed. He goes, well, the candy module is 600 bucks. The scanner could cost you five to 6,000 if we couldn't reuse some of the boards. So basically the candy module acted like a fuse. And I was like, yes. I was so excited to spend money <clears throat> because it was a lot less money. So I walk in the car, I go, don't touch nothing. Now, if I want to make that circuit up live and working, what do I'm going to use? What's under that car? Under that car? A junction, a junction box. A lot of shops don't have jumper boxes. If they do, are they charged? No. But they come out, they spark the thing together. They, I guess they wish they were welders. And then they connect it right on. And I'm sitting there going, going nah, and I shut off, it's going, nah. I said, I got a car, what are you doing? And he's walking around, what did, you just, what did you just do? What do you mean, I didn't do nothing. What did you just, this thing's buzzing. It sounds like my alarm clock in the morning. He goes, well, the battery was dead and I gave you some current. How much current did you give me? <laughs> Dude, you like to weld. I can't weld with this stuff. The screens don't work that way. <laughs> well, these studies work. Yep. Deploy. Did, uh, was there a serious injury? No serious injury. Oh, that's kind of funny. It is kind of funny because I'd expect to see glass, you know, the body. I hated that. I, I hated that as a kid. What, did not hit the windshield. So what works? Well, well what, what, if the seatbelt works, when we do a pre-breaking, what should the seatbelt do if it works? It should lock. So the guy's head never hit the windshield or the steering column. That's a high head too. Yeah, but look with the Volvo. It was right on top of that bumper. It was the bumper and just right on top of it. It bent the frame. <clears throat> it, this is just food for thought. <clears throat> Usually the nose goes down, right? And then we get a high hit. 
high hit doesn't blow dead. So it kind of <coughs> no, because it, it because it's not the sensor. I see sensors get cracked because they're mounted on the right. Fords. Right. Because the sensor, it just proves to you that the sensor isn't what makes the call. Right. That's my point. It's just a signal in, and we have to get to voltage thresholds. But you wonder, you say, how high can that voltage threshold be if it, if it gave an input of a, a vibration or shock when it's mounted to the end of a, 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 a frame rail, and it bent the frame rail? Yeah, no, no, but see what I'm saying is I think it would have should at least, at least, let's say, took him out of suppression and pulled the seat down. So even though we pre-braked and we locked up the belt because the belt worked, at least tripped the light. At least tripped the light, or at least pulled, make the distance, don't allow the distance to increase between the occupant and the cover. So let's put a pre-tension on. This is my thought. I, I put those up there to hear your thoughts. So keep it coming. <clears throat> well, one of my friends does that. <clears throat> yeah, because people ask me, how many modules do you do that I do that go in the trash? Everyone goes in the trash. No one's coming down because unless there's a fatality, then you don't get the car to begin with. Uh, but my buddy, had, we ran out of time. We're going to use it on the second night. He's got all the data. He's got one. He goes, I want to show you something. It went from 50, 60, 70, 80, and then one frame later, it went from 80 miles an hour down to zero. It don't show you after that. But that is the brake speed, the vehicle speed of the car. Brake speed implied the RPM. The dude looks like we went out on the highway or went around somebody, right? 50 to 80, 30 mile an hour was up two frames. I didn't get the measurement of the frames. It wasn't a scope. But it will be in our second class. It went from 80 down to zero in one frame. Where did that car come to? A stop. <laughs> and then the data is blank after that. Who keeps that? I don't know. Can they read it? Yes, they do. There is memory in there. There's capacitors, whatnot. But that's not something that, it's a tool that gets it. And let's face it, we have normal um, scan tools. It could be in there. I wouldn't know how to get to it. I'm thinking when they do crash, that's going to be better. Right. You see the going to the wall. I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, that's going to be playing instead of the what middle-aged women shouldn't do. It's going to be playing before the next class. I'm just getting permission right now from NASDAQ. I want to play those videos and the dummy sitting in the car. And you want to see the difference between a five-star and a three-star? Half that dummy's out the front door during that crash. They were doing front crashes where they hit flat. Now they're doing front crashes where they hit a point. Is that more of an impact? They're hitting the side of that car with a ram, with, with, a, veg, with a wedge now. They're not just hitting frontals. But I want to be, have permission to play it because if we tape it, I want permission. Okay? We'll use a lot of resources for this. Safe Car, uh, General Motors website, Toyota's factory website, Ford's factory website. Ford's got a, a, a thing that you can use. It's called Digital Snippets. I mean, I did a lot of research because I want to know the specific stuff. But I do that same research every week regardless. I've been doing research on SRS for about five years now. I've been working on it for 30 years. But is it SRS when I was back when I was a kid? Or I had a knee bolster, a collapsible steering column, and what? When I locked up the seat, what should the belts do? So that is a new technology. What I thought last night was the newest technology in the world, and it kept me up half the night. And I called my wife at 2.30 in the morning. She goes, what are you doing? I go, hell, I'm up. I figured I could text you a message. I got from 2.30 to 6 to, forget, to finish three sentences. She texts me right back, what are you up? I said, this guy told me something in class. Oh, great. We're going to be up for a week? I'll know by 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. I couldn't find the information I wanted. G called at 8 o'clock and I said, what's Pierre doing today? I'll give him the message. All I want is Pierre writing before this class. Just write. Before. And you promised me he would. <clears throat> then he called you a bum and all this stuff and stuff. But <clears throat> something about you didn't buy him lunch, you didn't buy him dinner. Or <clears throat> Nothing new. Okay. I want you to look at one more, please. Again, I'm looking for feedback. So your questions are the same questions I have when you get in the car. Okay, impact collision damage number three. Did the SRS system work as designed? The last one, I just want to get a little feedback. This is the stuff I see. 
Here's a 2009 Cadillac Escalade. This is a hybrid. But forget it's a hybrid. It's still an Escalade. <laughs> yeah, because it hit the tree, right? Okay. The front bumper got damaged. The front bumper got damaged, right? The grill got scratched up. The hood's pretty good. I don't think they did anything to the hood. It looks like it's arched, but it's actually up. This fender took a direct hit right here. It crumpled this fender up into that driver's door. Okay? Moderate to severe? I don't think moderate. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the seatbelts should have done their job. Okay. Did the airbag go off? It's a catalog. Dude, you got these options, man. You got to use them. I'm Dr. Dre. Hey. All right. The airbag went off. The airbag went off. Let's take this one step further. What about the seat? The seat, all the extra tension is right there. And I know that's extra, that's extra slack, and it took up the room between the occupant and what? The cover, right? And then I go to the end, it's as tight as could be. Did that work? Yeah. To something that I would have thought that would questionably call it a moderate hit. But I saw moderate hits. And it's driving me nuts because it keeps me up at night. Why didn't it at least do the seats on that 07? The guy was from New York, the car don't like the driver, you know, don't like the state, don't like the pollution, don't like the taxes, I ain't gonna work. You know, you don't even wash me, I'm not doing it. You're on your own, dude. Here comes the car, are you looking forward, you know? But this thing, this thing did to me did what it's supposed to do, but I think it did one step more. But that was a more direct I want to go over diagnosing and one case study, we're out of here, okay? Can you guys give me like five more minutes? Well, this is how I approach every car. Get the vehicle's complete history. Can we always get the complete history? No. no, they're auction cars, used cars. Let's get as much information as we can. And we care about collision damage and repairs if we're dealing with SRS. Agreed? Or wiring or any kind of major work. Record all the vehicle information. There are some cars like Toyota, they're going to give you 52 PIDs. They're going to give you the pre-tensioner uh, and the airbag module, all the resistance. They will tell you the weight on each four corners of the seat. I put in General Motors, is the mill light illuminated? Yes. What's the battery voltage? 13.4. Is the seat belt buckled or unbuckled? Dude, that's all you get. That's all you get. So some of them are going to have a lot of information, some are not. I want to record it. I want to record it. If you go out and it's an on-demand or continuous monitor code, and I go out and I yank out that plastic trash on the balls on the seat, and the problem goes away, could that light go off? Yeah, so I want to eliminate everything. Uh, and I want to do it quickly. Next, perform a visual inspection, but don't touch nothing. Let's find out the trash is under there, but let's not do anything. Let's look for major body work. Let's try to figure out why when we hit a pothole, we set off $9,600 worth of airbags. Could there have been a pre-existing accident? Can we have a light on because of a pre-existing accident where something got deployed but didn't get fixed? Yeah. Could we have sensors that are too sensitive right now because they took a good impact? There's, po there's endless possibilities. Okay. Next, scan the SRS module for DTC's current and history as well as data bits. Record all the information. Before you begin your diagnosis, it's in black. Locate and read what? The arming and disarming procedure. I need to make you safe. I need the vehicle to be safe. Just take the five minutes and locate it. Check for TSBs and recalls. Read system description operations. And I always want you to print out a schematic. And I'm going to be honest with you. I got Mitchell on demand. I got all data, identifix, and everything. I use Mitchell because I want to look at the wiring diagram on one page. All data starts here. Came over here, oh, it's all seats, where the hell did that come from? Okay, and then I'm right, seat heaters, and then I'm back over here again. Right? But what does all, I mean, Identifix do? Not Identifix, excuse me, Mitchell on Demand. They do. No, I say Identifix. Yeah, the color two SG1. The Identifix will give you the uh, schematics, but they usually manufacture copies. That's why I like to see, they'll have one or two pages of SRS, and like the gentleman said, they're all color copy, and you can view it that way. And that's the quickest way to do it, to find it real quick. All right, tools we need, electronic information. 
Electronic, I worked for the dealer. We used to get a one inch uh, book of electrical books on a certain model, a certain year. I'd be chasing wires that didn't exist. By the end of the year, the supplements would come out, they're about four inches thick. So I know the electronic information sometimes gets updated quicker than what? The regular manuals. Uh, scan tools. Factory scan tool possible. I say factory only if you want to do some programming. If I use a Ford IDS and I go to reprogram a module to as built data, I'm just pushing a bunch of buttons. It's real simple. But I don't knock generic scan tools because generic scan tools have come a long way with the software and stuff. You probably have the same capabilities I do. But I just don't use as many of them you guys do. Load device for piles and grounds. What's that going to be? A headlight. It's going to pull three or four amps. We're not going to use it on the, right directly to the PCM, but we're going to use it on power and ground circuits that are external to the computer. Now, if I put a DVOM, if I put a test light or a NOID light, can that light illuminate and read the voltage of a power and ground, say 12.6 volts? Am I guaranteed that those circuits can carry any kind of current? No, because it could be a bad connection, green depth or whatnot. So I want you to use the load test. Again, assortment of load devices. Even though you see a bunch of them right now, I want to pass this around. This is the Volvo one. This one here, I want you to read the, the resistance on it and tell me if it hasn't fit into the range of 90% of the stuff you've seen tonight. Real quickly, headlight tester, 10 bucks. I just take flexible timing leads and put them on there. Take them out of your toolbox. You haven't used a timing light in years, right? If you haven't used it in years, has the guy next to you used it in years? Use his. Let him use your light. Okay? DVOM, uh, and a scope if possible. Scope is really, really good thing to use. Uh, and you get used to seeing good and bad waveforms. And I'd like you guys to build a library. I get boxes of these load to tools. Boxes of these things. If I don't have $600, I got $1,000 worth in there. These blue ones, I use 99% of the time. I check them before I use them. 39 bucks. Half these are still in bags. They fit fusions and focuses and every different make model. Right now, 1.8 to 2.5. Has that been following the range we've been in? Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to keep it quick and easy. I even have the factory load tools, the Chrysler load tools. Do I drag all this stuff out or do I grab that little Volvo? Volvo. Grab the Volvo. Now, jumper wise, I explained this at break to a bunch of guys. These, be cautious. Remember, we do a self check. We're looking for resistance in that igniter circuit. Are these, can we guarantee there's no resistance in these? We use these every, every day, right? We pull them out. Do we heat them up? Is there a chance we can create resistance? Mine all have resistance. I'd rather you guys use short, straight, quick jumper wires. If we're checking for 2.4 ohms, and say it's going to go from a range from 1.5 to 3.5, can I have three additional ohms on one of these wires? Yeah, so be very cautious when you use that. Because we could have a code that's the same code, but we don't think we're fixing anything. It could be a bad clock spring. It could be a bad connection. But as long as we have this style jumper cable hooked in, we think we still have a problem. I don't want you to replace pots if you don't have to. Uh, airbag deployment. I mean, I got these tools. <clears throat> There's nothing funner than doing it yourself. Okay? Now, you're supposed to you take the actual other tool that comes with this. It's a big box. You're full, full of sand and water. You're going to weigh it down. You're going to strap the thing there. I'd rather have those jumper wires that are 30 feet long sit over there with, you know, 1.6 uh, amps and go, pop. But that's just me. I'm weird. Um, one quick case study. Food for thought and then you get out of here. 2009 GM Sierra SRS message. This is the stuff we're going to run across. I'm going to do simple ones and hard ones, but I'm gonna, these are average for me. 2009 GMC Sierra SRS message and warning lights illuminated. It says on the instrument cluster, service airbag, and what's illuminated? Okay, car's got like 3,500 miles on. I take the tech two, supplemental inflatable restraint. I go to that, it says view all DTCs. Can you see that? Hit the button, same thing your scan tools do at your shop. Now, this is what I want you to read. I usually see system configuration problem. It's B1001. This is a B1019. It says, system configuration error, incomponent installed, incorrect component installed. The module is seeing something it doesn't like or doesn't recognize. So I said to the guy, I walk in the shop again, I go, dude, you told me you put a windshield in and an upper pad on this car. Okay? 
So I come in, I said, okay, it was during a storm. What's the chance we could have a voltage surge and screw up the, the software in the PCM, I mean the SRS module? Slim to none, but there's lightning storms all the time that happen. So I said, real quickly, let me just recalibrate that module. I don't want to replace any parts. Oh, I get the module for tomorrow. No, we don't replace any parts. There's no guessing. So I find the sensing and diagnostic module. That's what GM's called. I put the VIN number in. It goes in here, and it says you got the same, you're going to reprogram this, this module with the same calibration. We don't suggest doing it. Do you want to say yes? I always okay it. I run the test, it loads into my laptop, now it loads into the car. When it's all done, after the, uh, the, if the module gets programmed, shut the key off for a minute. That's critical. And I'm going to tell you guys, if we ever cover, ever cover programming, General Motors car, if somewhere during the middle, your computer goes into hybrid and whatnot, a cord gets kicked out, do not shut the key off. Leave it on, the computer could be gone. But I want you to try. I want you to fix the problem and reflash it again with the key on while it's powered up. Do not power it down. Okay. The system configuration incorrect component installed. DTC resets immediately. So I go back in the shop. I says, "What did we change again, Dave? The upper dash pad took about 10 minutes. Now this car has got two seat belts that lock. It has." two front airbag modules, and it has a crash sensor. And it has an on and off key for the passenger side. So real quickly, they're waving, did I do something? Oh, he's exercising. Um, simulators we use, how can I isolate all the pods? If, they, if it sees something didn't like, if it created a high resistance or something, it should have said that. But why don't I take a load tool and disconnect each one of the pretensions in each one of the modules? Can I do that? It'll either see the module or see the resistance value and pass it. But there's no component attached to that what? Resistance to come up with the incorrect component. So I did that. I did it on the, on the seat rails. I did it on the uh, driver's steering wheel. And I did it on the passenger. Now the frontal crash sensor, it's, a, it's, a, it's an IC circuit, integra integrated control circuit. There's no resistance. It'd be 6 million, it doesn't mean nothing to me. Why do I unplug it? It'll be an open circuit. If it's an open circuit and I clear the code and I cycle the key, can it tell what's plugged into it? I'm thinking it can't. I'm thinking it's an open circuit. It can't tell that the wrong component's there. So I do all that and rewrite it and it stays on. It stays on. What would you guys do next? Huh? No, call Dave. No, we gotta call John. We're in I need to talk to the tech again. So I grabbed the owner of the tech. I said, I'm missing something here. Would you please tell me what you did? And he said, I pulled the earbag module. I, he said, I, it, that module, it all says that it, it's lit up. I looked at it, made sure it was connected, and I took the upper pad off. Now, the upper pad, he said, it took me about 15 minutes. I said, did you disconnect anything? He said, yeah, the passenger side bag. But I, I can get to that by moving the glove box. I check terminal tension, I put stable in 22, and it doesn't have that code. But every time I put a simulator or disconnect something, make an open circuit, it comes up with the incorrect component. I'm saying, is, what doesn't it see? So he goes, do you want me to order a module? No. No, I don't. We're not going to, I need some time to think about this. So I worked on it for about two and a half hours, and I went home. I said, dude, it's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Tell me you ain't going to have the truck for another day. I need to think about this. So I came back the next morning. I said, call the customer right now and tell me if that light was on before. No, we created it. Was the light on when you brought it down with a broken windshield? Did you have a tow? No, we drove it down with a limb coming through the dash. Okay, dude, I, I said, let me grab the technician. I said to the technician, I want to remove that pad. You know what he says to me? In front of the owner, he says to me, what are you trying to accomplish? I want to remove that pad. Would you please do that for me? I want to see if you put your arms and hands down on something where well, you could have made contact with something. Open the circuit, made a loose connection. He goes, there's no wiring under the dash. I go, are you serious? Like 300 feet of it. So what do you, it's like, where'd that go? You know what I mean? They just, what do they got? Fairy dust that goes from here to here? I don't know. <laughs> so I says, please, would you do that? And he says to me one more time, what are you trying to accomplish? I said, I just want to take a visual look. What do you want to look at? I want to look at the airbag, I want to look at all the wiring, and I want to look behind that instrument cluster. He goes, the instrument cluster works. And I go, wait a minute, that light works. 
But that instrument cluster is a major part of the SRS system. That light works. That light is on what? It could be on class two. It could be on anything. It's a 2009. Could there be a separate circuit going from the airbag module? Could there be? Separate than the class two that's going to be shared. There could be. Dude, I want you to take that cluster off. Let me do the cluster first. And the boss is standing there. He says, he goes, it takes five minutes. I had it off three times. Wait a minute. No, no, no. I asked you. Okay, let's not bother going here. Take the cluster off. And he did. He had it on five minutes. But don't pull it off. I want to pull it off. So I pull it off. This is what I have. I can't clear it. Been on the car three or four hours. Can't clear it. And I said, it had to be something we did. I need to check to see if we get an open circuit. I, I pull it back gently. I look at the connector. There's about eight inches. It's clean. After that, it's all dusty. So the tech's sitting next to me. I go, hey, this looks funny. So I held the dash, and I, he, I pushed it in with a loud snap. He goes, you didn't break it, did you? <laughs> I said, no. Did you hear that snap? He said, loud. Did you crack something? I said, no. I latched the connector back in. It was out about an eighth of an inch. I cycled the key. You know what went off? It said incorrect component. It actually was on a separate circuit from the airbag module, and it was, it was an open circuit. Seatbelt buckles, are they an input right now? Do they have to work? To check them real quick, can we just simply do a resistance check? No. No. What do we, we may have what kind of switch in it? All, All effect. We can only check that with a DVOM. What is pre-breaking? Pre is hard breaking before the collision. If we're not buckled in, what area can we fall in? What risk area can we fall in during deployment? First two or three inches. Can it hurt you or kill you? Oh. Absolutely. We got how many generations of airbags? Three. First is what? <coughs> Second is what? Depowered. And the third one is dual stage. Dual stage. So we come around a lot. We've come a, we have a lot of technology since then. <coughs> Can we have an inflatable restraint inside the steering column? Yeah, but all steering columns are meant to deflate. I mean, meant to uh, collapse, compress, collapse. It's a bigger word than delicatessen, so I get screwed up every once in a while. But that pretensioner in there, or infl uh, inflation device, makes it now a lot easier for the steering column to collapse. Here's a picture again. That steering column, so uh, actually it deployed, it collapsed? <clears throat> it collapses. <clears throat> That's collapsed. <clears throat> and if it deploys, what kind of circuit is now? Open circuit. <clears throat> it actually moved. It moved about two inches. It moved about now the steering wheel, now the steering column can collapse further. <clears throat> but they've done that for years. Again, the connector is what? Hard to see. And to get that shot, if I was in the car, where's my head? Right on the pedals. Right on the pedals. Okay. Front drivers and passenger seat side airbag modules. <clears throat> Here's a 06 Highlander. Oh, five Highland, excuse me. How many ohms am I looking at? 2.4 ohms. So we're still falling in that range. The side airbags, do they deploy faster or slower than the front airbags? Faster. Why? Less distance. <clears throat> Less distance between the occupant and the side of the car. Now, here's, this, here's that um, Highlander, which I actually, I'm going to just unroll it real quick. But here's the cushion. I'm just going to unfold it. <clears throat> and that's what it's basically going to look like. Now, the earlier versions used what that made it look like smoke? Cornstarch or talcum substance. What is the later ones, the bag made of or lubricated with? Silicone properties, exactly. Okay, here's a 2005 Toyota Avalon. It deployed the side airbag. The first two or three inches is what? The wrist zone. Now, <clears throat> realize that if we can have a code for an open circuit. An open circuit can look like a deployment. I've got a, I've got especially a Volkswagen. I went in there and it said the side airbags would basically had an open circuit, 
right in my head, it's either bad connection, right? right. Pull connection, or the bag went off. If the bag went off, what's the igniter circuit now? Oh. An open circuit. <clears throat> the bags on the Volkswagen, side of the bag on the side, they deploy. They never rip through the cover. Where'd the bag go? Around the back. The actual, when I found that, I said, look, pull the seat out, I'm looking for a bad connection, or I'm looking for a deployed bag. Well, we know it's not a deployed bag. And I said, how do you know that? He says, you will see it rip the frame. How do we know it's not a deployed bag? And I'll be honest with you guys, I see as many deployed bags with open circuits as I see, now, do I do a high volume of airbags right now? Yeah. No way, even though I've been doing drivability the last 10 years in the dealer and the last 12 years by myself, I'm not an expert at it. I do a lot of drivabilities. So things I trust, some things I don't trust. <clears throat> I said, I'm both that, I want to look at that. So I had not pulled the cushion out and those bags were deployed. And it went around the back of the seat. So I said, dude, I want those. I want this, I want to show the class that they didn't rip through this, that first two or three inches was not powerful enough to rip or wasn't set up properly that it would rip right through the seam. <clears throat> and again, what I was trying to say was I see as many broken brand new, brand new open circuit or shorted circuit airbag modules, clock springs, I seatbelt pretentious, I do a high volume of SRS. I see a lot of OEM factory equipment that's broken and it's installed. And I feel real bad because like on a sudden like, you know, I go in these shops for years, most of my shops I got my own, you know, keys and whatnot for, but they don't work at the same labor rate we do as technicians. And no one in this room is as high as I am per hour. <clears throat> I go up to a Jeep and it takes, I go up there and I, it takes me a little bit, I have the guy, technician rip apart the dash, the lower part of the dash, so I can just get to the lead and I can put a simulator on it, a load showing the resistance like it's a complete circuit. And then I gotta say to the guy, hey dude, that's an open circuit in there. All right, let me show you, I use the load simulator, let me plug it back in, whatnot. He looks at me, he puts his head down. He goes, that's like a three and a half, four hour job. I said, yeah, I realize that. I can't even see it. I feel bad, but I'm, you know, to me, I would test them before I put them in. That's what I would personally do myself. I would test them before I put them in. Can I test them? When we disc, when we get a brand new airbag, what are the connected? Where are the two pins are? They're shorted together. So we got to put it. We got to go in there and measure it without and remove the shorting bar, right? So at least I'm just checking to see if it's an open or is a completed circuit with a resistance built in through the igniter circuit. Or do we have an open circuit? And I'll be honest with you guys, I see a lot of brand new components with open circuits. And they'll call me and say, Dave, we put everything in it, we need you to flash it. Or we need you to program the module, we need you to do as-built data, we need you to initialize the module, we need you to do whatever you do. I come down there and say, dude, we got a problem. We got a hard DTC for an inflator loop circuit. And I, I, I have the technician rip apart what I need to rip apart, I put my load device in there. And I said, no, you did everything you were supposed to do. One of the new parts failed. Clock spring? How can I test the clock spring? I take the airbag off and I put a load device. Does it change the DTC or the self-test? No, it's an open circuit still an open, or high resistance still. Now how do I eliminate the clock spring? I now go underneath the, the dash and disconnect the clock spring. I put my load device, my simulator in it, which simulates an airbag, igniter circuit. The code goes off. What do I have a bad one? clock spring. I asked the guys, was it, did you install it when the wheel was free? You know, did you put the rack on later? Did you, what? No, I said, Dave, that was the last thing we did before we put the new airbag on. I've had to come out and say to them, the brand new airbag and the clock spring is no good. That's a lot easier fix than a passenger side. Or a, uh, a seat where <clears throat> we did the terminal, most of the um, seat airbags, there'll be a harness with it. But sometimes they try to use the original harness. Can there be a terminal issue there, right there? When they put it all the back together, they do. But just realize, if we have open circuit, it's either a bad connection or what happened? Got deployed. Got deployed. Brings my next point. 
Again, everything I wrote down on here, I didn't want you guys taking notes. I want it on here. Aftermarket seat covers. Can aftermarket seat covers affect the way an airbag deploys on a seat? Sure, it can cover the thing. If it doesn't have enough power or is redirected to not rip open the seam, if it's able to rip open the seam, it's now going to rip open the airbag cover, right? I mean, the uh, seat belt. It's going to rip that cover off as well. If there's not a cutaway for where that seat belt is supposed to, when it inflates, there's an area for it to inflate. Also, it can affect the occupant, it can affect the passenger system, the front passenger system. If we put heaters and stuff in it, if we put heaters and stuff in it, and we got the sensors, we got like a, a bladder type sensor under the seat, and we add a bunch of cushion, or we have antennas in the back of the cushion on the Hondas, and we put all this cushion and we put a heater circuit in there, could it affect it? it how about the, uh, the seat belt covers, or even the factory ones? If we have a car with a lot of leather seats, a lot of option, what do they usually have behind the backrest of the front seats? Cargo containers, right? We go to do, we go to zero test the seat, and if there's five pounds of the tender in the back in that, inside that bag, can it throw the weight off? Sure it can, sure it can. If the seat covers have those bags in and the factory doesn't, again, can it affect that system? Yeah, it can add the weight, it can have some, you know, there's not, it can add a lot of different effects to the car. If we got toys hanging off the car seat, around the headrest, whatnot, it all can affect the zero and the calculation that seat is producing. So the thing is this, we got five pounds in the back seat, we got five pounds of toys hanging off the headrest, say it's gone up ten pounds higher, I'm just using this for example. Seventy-nine pounds, that doesn't deploy. Seventy-nine point three six, or we use eighty pounds or less, that passenger seat is not supposed to deploy. It shuts off. It stays in suppression. We add 10 pounds of toys and stuff hanging weight to that seat, and we bring it from 79 to 89, will it work? Yeah. Could someone get hurt? Could a small person, a child, or an elderly person, small stature person, could they be hurt? Sure, they could be hurt. Anytime an airbag does save lives, it's a great system. It cuts down on major injuries and death, but people can be hurt just because of their bodily uh, their structure. All right, stay properly seated in the seat with the seat buckles. Never lean on the side of the door pillows. If we put a pillow or you know, a blanket and let the kid fall asleep on the door, and his head is edged real close to the edge of the door, if he's from the, wood, what, the first, well, how many inches? Two or three inches. Could he get severely hurt? Yes, what happens to the first two or three inches? It's got to, the bag has got to rip through the cover, break through the seam, so that's the most powerful part of the deployment, the inflation. That's the risk area. We've got to be real careful with that. A rapidly deploying side airbag, seat or door mounted, can cause serious injury and even death. Side airbags deploy faster than front airbags due to less protection and closer proximity of the side of the vehicle to the occupant. The door can touch the, 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 the occupant, right? The other vehicle can come through the door and touch the occupant. So they, they, they ignite faster. And the, the average is about five milliseconds. If that's what a normal airbag deploys at, these gotta be happening quicker than that. Quicker than that. Can you see that? Can you see five milliseconds? No, you can start to see 100 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds when you blink your eye. Is that fast? That's fast. That was the only thing missing in the 50s, in the 60s and 70s. Technology hasn't caught up yet. Now that technology is here, we can take it in a bunch of different directions. Now, a lot of stuff I read with NASTAF. NASTAF is a great resource. They use safecar.gov. And any, any, any accidents that have fatalities, NASTAF gets involved. National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. They get involved. They conduct a lot of their own tests themselves. And, um, you know, again, any kind, you know, they do constant surveys or whatnot, but the airbags do save lives. They save lives if you're what? If you're restrained in. How are you restrained in? Seat buckles. How many points? Three points. It's not the old days when you had them across your lap. You got them across your shoulder as well. All right. Roof mounted curtain airbag modules. And let me pass around a couple of those modules real quick. 
Here's a side one. And here's a side one deployed. Here's a side one deployed. This is the one that I showed in the pictures that I actually unbolted and started to unfold out. And the bag is from a deployed one. Now, on the bench, on this bench over here, it's a fully working airbag system on the right. It's out of a service van. On the left side, we'll have a, a, some of these displays right here. Now, here's a roof-mounted uh, side airbag curtain. Ford calls the canopy. But we'll have a cylinder right here, and we'll have a, some sort of piping, and then the curtain itself can be anchored in different places, and the end of it will use a tether strap. Now, this one here, you'll see it on that display bench, very flexible, and the tube isn't that long. Here's a Volkswagen, and this is off an 06 GTI, and it's all one piece. So once we put it up there, it spans all the windows and the doors. Okay? And then we have, I'm going to pass one around that's been deployed. He took the curtain off. Now, a lot of these are single stage. Let me go that way. We'll head that way. A lot of these are single stage. But we could have like a Toyota or Honda uh, minivan where it'll spin from the front of the car, especially a Toyota. It'll come up the A-pillar. It'll go across the driver's door. It'll go across the sliding door. And it'll go across the rear quarter. Glass. Because we can have multiple seats in that car. That's a multi-passenger vehicle. Multi... <laughs> multi the vehicle, but we'll have a stage on each end. We'll have a stage on each end. So depending on the length of the curtain airbag, it could be just a single stage, or they could be deploying on both ends. It could be filling up the curtains from both sides. So again, now, one thing I want to make with, with roof-mounted airbags, they inflate, and they stay inflate longer than any other airbags in the car. Because if I come up and I crash in this gentleman right here, the impact, it's over, right? Five milliseconds, that front bag went off. If, it, if the SRS module said it met moderate to the um, uh, severe threshold, I'm going to set it off, I'm going to take it out of suppression mode, and I'm going to set it off. But that's a quick impact, right? Even if the car moves afterwards, that's a quick impact. How about a rollover? Is it quick? The car takes some time, it's rolling over. The whole event takes longer. So these airbags inflate just as fast as a side airbag, they inflate fast. But they deflate slower. And basically, as you'll see that bag going around, there's a small hole in it. I didn't bring the ones that I deployed at home because they have a lot of talcum powder and, and um, st cornstarch substance in them. But the vents are much larger. So we take all that harmless nitrogen gas and we fill up the bag. It's the vent that tells us how fast we're going to deflate it. And the roof mounted bags are really small, the vents. And the side ear bags, as you'll see around, they're still small as well. So it takes longer for the gas to dissipate. So the side ear bags, they deploy faster or slower than the front ones? Faster. Okay? The roof ear bags, do they stay inflated longer? Why do they stay inflated longer? Because the rollover vent takes what? longer. And how do we make it deflate, I mean, stay inflated longer? What do we do with the small events? Small events to bleed it off. <clears throat> and again, I set up this class and I'm going to ask things over and over again because I don't want you having to think about this tomorrow. I want to calmly know. Took the Volkswagen, the 06 GTI. How many ohms? 2.2. <clears throat> Door side airbag modules. Here's one. I want to bring Peter into this. Um, I love technology, and I want to show you how it's ever-ending. And Peter told me something last night. Again, he's a guy that's he's a part of my network that I respect a lot, and he's, he's my BMW guru. And um, Peter, can you mind coming down for a couple minutes? And this technology that they're using right now that he was telling me about last night, it was fascinating. But it isn't something brand new. It isn't something coming out in 2009. It's been out for a while. But on this magazine, on this... Um, on this uh, display over here, you'll see the BMW door bag. Here's the bottom view, and here's the top view. I put them both here. BMW had the idea is, how much area are we working between the seat and the door pillar? Small, small about area. So we have a real 
close tolerance there. Now, what's on the door an inch forward? How much square feet do we have on the door? Much greater. It's saying I can put a door module, airbag on the door, and provide more safety to the occupant because I can displace that airbag over a greater area. Does that make sense? Now, I want you to hear something about the doors, and I want them to tell you, tell them the years they started, too. Uh, it started in the, uh, actually, now I'm a little uncertain about the exact year. It started in the, uh, what we call E65 and E66. It's not new. No, it's well, 2001 right. or so, and definitely in the uh, 5 Series that started uh, a few years later, what we call E60 models. Bottom line is, they did not put a mechanical sensor in the door to sense an impact. They put a pressure sensor within the door so that an impact anywhere on the door will increase the pressure and make the bag blow faster. Here's the key. When you work on the cars, if you do anything to disrupt the sealing of the door, you put speakers in, you cut a hole in it, you don't put it back together right, you don't replace that nasty urethane sealant when you put the panel back in, the pressure sensor is not going to get the pressure rise it's supposed to get because you just vented the pressure through a hole you created. Same is true when you get a car comes into some other guy butcher. So, this and is this a, is not new technology. And they built it into the module, by the way. <clears throat> How about rotted doors? X5. X5 doesn't have it. Uh, maybe, maybe the new one does. That I put in and I pull the nose off and it rips a little. No, no, no. Uh, it's it's all the ones that have a solid panel on the inside of the door, like the the five series and the seven series. The X5 doesn't have it. The ones with the membrane, the soft membrane, don't have it. It's got to have a panel. You bolt in all the way around with a lot of bolts, and they hang a lot of the hardware on the inside of that. Metal panel. It's a metal, or it could be a hard plastic panel, but so far it's been metal, yeah. Solid. Solid, yeah, hard, a hard panel. But the idea is they're, they're actually measuring pressure change within the door. And they're doing it, so far they've been doing it with the door module. It has multiple functionality. It powers this, but it also has other functionality within the door, you know, the computer. See that's air pressure? Air pressure. No, air pressure. It's actually measuring atmospheric pressure. Yeah. So the window doesn't have, is separately sealed. Yes, the window. Well, I think that they're just looking at a certain amount of leakage through the window gasket, but that window gasket has to be in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Gray area. Yeah. Well, no. That they have. You know, they're just looking at the channel being able to seal the window against the door, and yes, that's sealed separately. How about rust? Oh, as soon as you get rust, you're in your own, and you're on your own. As soon as you get a hole in the door, you're on your own. <laughs> Not supposed to, but, you know, with the right malfunction, yeah, that could happen. <laughs> like he was talking about the door last. Oh, yeah. Somebody <laughs> hammered. <laughs> what about being submerged? Uh, you know, I'm, assu I'm assuming that their logic would preempt some of that, but you never know. I mean, that's, that's one of those gray areas. I, I haven't heard horror stories of false deployments, but uh, basically my recommendation with a car that's been in water is you, you don't resurrect them, they're always a total. And it's reasons like that, because you don't know how that's going to affect anything. Not that it's submerged now in the process of an accident, but it's been submerged, came out, somebody said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shampoo the carpets and uh, sell it as a used car. Uh, oh, God, you know, how many possible ways can we get messed up? And that's the one the commercials see the car rocking back and forth, and it says what? Fresh detailed interior, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pierre, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. He told me this last night, and I said, dude, this is going to keep me up about 2 o'clock in the morning. Swear to God, got about an hour and a half sleep last night. I had to find that out. It's just stuff like that. I can't get enough of this. It's such, it's, and the research is not new. As Pierre told you, 2000, 2001, approximately when it came out. That's 10 years old. That's 10 years old. You know, so this is not new technology, but it changes the way specifically a particular car make, manufacturer does it. And again, he's one of my valuable, valuable resources. He's my BMW guru. <clears throat> and, you know, again, I can't emphasize that enough. There is so much experience in this room right now. You guys got to bounce stuff off each other. Because, you know, sitting next to each other, minimum 10 years. I went to train a class and the guy goes, I got 30 years experience in the business. I look at him and I go, who don't? Are you serious? Who don't? You know, it's crazy. It's like, <clears throat> I've been in it that long, if not long, I've been in longer than that. I won't 
get into ages, but <clears throat> I worked next to Ben Franklin and we got along, you know? All right, knee bolsters and knee bolster airbags. Knee bolsters, again, when I was 16 years old working in a dealership, we had knee bolsters, they were padded. This is not new technology. Knee bolsters, they're mechanical, we're not talking airbags here. Knee bolsters are padded panels that are located in the front of the driver and the passenger occupants. They typically span the entire length of the lower dashboard as they are secured to the front eight pillars by brackets. They are designed to prevent injury to the upper legs and lower torso area of the occupant. Also prevents the occupant from sliding down under the deploying airbag. Under the, and I wrote these notes so you guys understand that. The knee bolsters are designed to absorb, even crush, during a frontal impact. But again, we're going to stop you from going underneath the dash. So if we're properly restrained, could we still slide a little bit under that seat? Yeah, the knee bolster, if it's equipped, will stop that from happening. We'll stop. The only thing is it was, was a real nuisance for us. That's the whole low of the dash. And then if they had a center console, that was behind the center, center of the dash going out to the console. For me to do any kind of dash work, that had to come off. And I tell you, that was a lot of work to get that off because of all the trim. Now, knee bolster airbag modules. Here's happened to be one on a Chrysler. As you see this, the front panel is held on with quick clips and then a strap with tether straps to make sure when that front panel comes off, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get forced towards the driver. This happens to be on a Chrysler vehicle. And here's the, here's the top view of it. And when the panel comes off, the bag comes out. And it protects your what? Your upper legs and your lower torso. It stops you from sliding under the car. <clears throat> okay. Headrest restraints. I went to a 2009 Mercedes. Now we have headrest restraints. <clears throat> this is when it's in place and they have not been deployed. This is when they've been deployed. Now, these can be reset. There's a special tool. It was missing from the glove box. It's an 09, so I figure it didn't get through pre-delivery. We had a special DLC connector tool that was under the seat in a Volkswagen. Two years later, I popped the rear seat to grab it. Is it there? No, they're all gone. They're all gone. But there's a special tool that fits in the glove box, and what you'll do is it has to be anchored. You grab the bow of the bag, and you pull it in, and you use the tool. You'll press down the tool, and you'll, with force, you'll snap the top back in. Well, we went to put the bottom in there. Let's say, let's say we can make a special tool. We were playing with what it looked like and, uh, from pictures and stuff and said, let's see if we can do it. But what they did is they used plastic teeth to lock it all together. When this deployed, it took the tips off the plastic tooth. So the first part is I told you we had to do what? We have to lock the bottom. I couldn't keep the bottom locked because the top of the teeth were all stripped. So we called our local Mercedes dealer. The parts guy right away said, hey, there's a reset tool. Yeah, we know. But he goes, we're going to change them. And he goes, why? He goes, the teeth are all, all the tops of the teeth are all chewed up. They're plastic. If they were metal, would they be like that? No. And he goes, yeah, that's the calm. That's what happens to them, a lot of them. He goes, what color you got? We got 18 in stock. <laughs> and they, they pay for it. So, <clears throat> again, we get, this is for rear end collision. Your head comes forward, is it gonna, and it hits the airbag, is it going to snap back? No, we took up the room. We're, we're trying to prevent injuries here. This took a 30 mile hit and it bent the bracket that, right underneath the bumper and deployed both bags. See that one deployed? Deployed both bags. What don't you see in the car? Some of the other bags went up. What do you want to see in the car? There's no powder. There's no powder. So, <clears throat> huh? No, no, no. They're, they're mechanical and there's a solenoid that holds them in place. So the impact, it knocks them loose. Um, <clears throat> but there was another airbag that let off in the car. But my point is this. The inside of this car was as clean as the outside. Except for the McDonald's fries everywhere. And I think the lipstick was through the steering wheel. But <clears throat> and I think the text message, I think the texting part of the keypad was in the instrument cluster. I think. <clears throat> we don't do that. You know, it says you can't use cell phones. And the guy in front of you is still going like this. And he's going like this. He's trying to spell. 
Well, I'm an old geezer. And I know he's an old geezer. Because the kids take computer lessons in school. My kid will stand over my shoulder when I'm writing a paper for class, when I was going for my master's. He went over my back. He's typing with fingers. Like this, boom, 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 boom. I can't even see his hands. And he's doing 100 words a minute. So I turn around and I'm going to text, why, oh, you, and I'm in a different lane. I come back over. And my daughter, I text my daughter a simple question. And she writes, KK. And I call on the phone. I go, so what the hell is KK? She goes, okay, you couldn't write Owen K? You have to write KK? And so I wrote all these words out one day. I sat there and she goes, Dad, can I show you what that look, was supposed to look like? And every word was like three, three um, letters or three vowels. And that was it. It was like boom, 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 boom. And so my wife calls me. No, she doesn't call me. She texts me. She texts me a hundred times. She got a hundred letters. And I'm still trying to answer the first one. So I call on the phone. I said, for God's sakes, will you stop so I can answer the first one? You're too slow. You're too old. Then call me on the phone. But New Mexico, I was down with Bernie. Bernie trained me for a week this summer. I get a lot of guys that I go for training for. G's one of my trainers. John Thornton's one of my trainers. Um, Bernie Thompson's one of my trainers. Um, Dave Scaler's one of my trainers. I fight with Dave all the time. We're like brothers. I fight with him like I fight with my sister. Can't stand him either. You know, it just, but I fight with him every day. Dave's a great guy. Louis, Louis teaches me. I get five guys I'll go around the country for. That's it. I don't want to learn something someone read out of a book and then try to repeat it and apply it towards my day. I want to know cold, hot facts. And if I tape it, if I write it, I want you guys to prove it. If I tell you something in class, don't trust me. Prove it. That's where we'll develop trust. What I say is from real, real world research, my experience and whatnot, I want you to check it for yourself. That's the ones you can trust as far as what information is coming out. The guys ask me all the time, what's your qualifications for the guy who trained you? I just want to know he's in pain the day before. I want him cut, burnt, I want, I want no stitches, electrical tape. I want something holding limbs on. That's the guy I want to train me, not the guy that reads a book. Okay, there's a solenoid resistance test. How many ohms is in here? 1.6. That's in the book. All the other values you saw, they're not going to give you those. They're not going to give you those. But this is in the book. It has to read, I believe, 1.4 to 1.7. Does that fall in range? Mm -hmm. If those teeth weren't stripped and I could get that back together, do I have any issue with that? Nope. No. <clears throat> if that was infinite or 0, 0.0 ohms, would I have a problem? <clears throat> Front passenger side SRS occupancy sensing system. Now, we'll call it a lot of different names. There's, everybody's got their own names. I just threw a couple up here. Occupant detection system, Chrysler vehicles. Passenger presence system, General Motors vehicles. We got occupant classification system, Toyota and Lexus vehicles. We can just keep changing the terminology. Honda, everything, BMW, everybody's got their own, um, own terminology. But basically, this is what's going on. It's an advanced system, right? It's a smart advanced system. So, the multiple deployment strategies, depending on the passenger's weight, the seat position and seat belt buckle switch input. The seat belt buckle is a big thing now. It has to work. It has to work properly. That's why I took the time. I want to go over it. It's a common failure. So I want to I make sure that we spend you know, a good 15 minutes on that because, I, because of the Hall effect switches. I want you to realize they're out there and there's a lot of them out there. The system is disabled if the occupant's weight is 79.37 pounds or less. We call that 80 pounds. <coughs> If that seat is off by 20 pounds, and that seat reads 99 pounds, and that girl or that the elderly person is only 79 pounds, should that be deploying? If that SRS module says, I want to take it to the first stage, I want to take it out of suppression, I want to go to first stage, I want to go to second stage, could somebody be hurt? I mean, they, granted, they could save your life, but could they be hurt as well? Sure, they're too small. Single and dual stage deployments, depending on the severity of the collision. Sensors are mounted to the seat tracks. The sensors are under the front seat cushion, Honda, Acura. Seat tracks, Toyota, Lexus, Chrysler. They use a strain gauge. Uh, weight sensors or bladder under the lower seat cushion, BMW. Now, I want to pass around. Here's the Honda. And it basically, here's the back cushion. 
and it actually has the OBDS uh, module that comes with it as well. And this are basically, this is like antennas. It'll tell you where the system, with a with a head, the position of the occupant's head is on this system, on this. And where, what sits here? This is the passenger side. What sits here? No, the side airbag. The module's down here, but the side airbag module. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Just terminology. Well, that's what I'm saying. Now, it's it's been said over and over that if we put a seat heater on top of this. Could it make, if this is electrical and these are like uh, sensors, like signal, radio signals, can it affect the radio signals? Right. Can it, even if these were just regular pressure sensors, if I put a cushion, a heater, and I bring out, could it dampen the, the weight or the effect on the sensor? Right. Yeah, it can. It, you know, we don't know how, you know, how what system, I'm not knocking any system, but just realize the factory, if that's a heated upper and lower seat, it's designed so that thing works properly. It's just not somebody attaching something. I've got a, a, an 09, a brand new truck, uh, but it, it, it's, it's an open cab and um, uh, open uh, bed and everything. But um, the seats, they, they, they burn you. They, they, they're so hot, they burn you. And my seat's got air conditioning as well. Well, if there's any, say there was any of those sensors in the car, is it all compensated for that? Now I got a lot. I go next to a lot of body shops. They're re, they're uh, uh, clean detailing shops, and they're aftermarket installer shops, always near by the body shop. I can throw a heater, aftermarket heaters, in my seat for 250 on my new service van if I want them. Could if they had side airbags, if they had uh, any kind of weight device in the lower cushion, the upper cushion, could I disturb that? Just understand, I could disturb that. So that, to me, if I have that in the van, it's not an option. It's not an option. I don't have it in the van, but either way, <clears throat> I don't care about the comfort of the passenger. I don't care about my comfort. <clears throat> here's that again. It can actually pick up the occupant's head on this. Um, here's that, this is off a, a Lexus. I did an 07, 08. I do a bunch of 07, 08s. This is a Lexus. It's an RX 350 or it's an RX uh, 400H. And this is one of the four corners gay, um, uh, sensors on the seat track. Chrysler has what they call a strain gauge. Same thing. It sits on all four corners. Now, Honda and Toyota simply to adjust the seat, to zero the seat and check the sensitivity of the weight, the seat's got to be all the way back and the back seat's got to be upright. And then if it's, if it's leveled up, it's got to be pushed down and the headrest has got to come down. Now, Honda, we got to take it out on the road. We got to excel it to 20 miles an hour, get on flat surface and check it with the weight on the seat. We're going to take the weight off, we're going to do it one way, and then we're, you know, there's multiple ways. Toyota and Lexus, I don't have to do that. But I already had 20 pounds of weight on the seat. I allow it to be off one pound either way. And that's me. I know I can read them off if they say, Honda will say under 6.6 .6 pounds or whatever, it's fine. I only give it one or two pounds. I'm a real pain in the neck when it comes to it. The cars have to be perfect. Can I raise the level if I let something go? Can I take it from 79 and bring it to 84? Can it deploy now? I, I, I won't take that risk. I won't take that risk. So I put it in and I said, hey, just, for, just for curiosity, I'm off 20 pounds, not negative 20 pounds, 20 pounds. I said, I wonder how much that's going to change when I add 66 pounds to it. It should go up to 86, right? It was close to 104, I believe. I got it all written down. I got about five notebooks. Use about three, three a month. Fill them right up. And because uh, I, I write all the VIN numbers, everything I find, whatnot. On it. But I, it multiplied as the weight, as I brought the weight up. It asked for 66 pounds. Can I put exactly 66 pounds in the car? I do. And I check those often. I make plates out of that. I check it. I'm up around 104 pounds. I've added 30 pounds onto a 50-pound person. Can they now deploy? Yeah. So I'm, I'm more, actually, I'm a more of a pain in the neck than the actual customer is. And who's more of a pain in the ass than me? The module is. Even though as I'm as hard as difficult I am to please, the module is still has to be pleased. If I let something out of that go, can the module still fail it? Sure, sure. So again, 
<clears throat> I don't allow this to be off. A lot of times you'll see the four corners of the seats, they'll have different voltages. I do a zero and a sensitivity, weight sensitivity check, and it'll bring them all back to where they should be. This one was like four and a half volts in one, half a volt in the other. The voltage was all crazy. And I couldn't change that at all. And again, 20 pounds off, and it was all, well over 100 when I hit 66 inch pound. This car has been in an accident. Can those sensors be damaged? Sure, big time. Quickly, Toyota Sienna van, SRS warning lights illuminated. It will always say on these things, if you got hit in the ass end, you got hit in the sides, front, whatever, it'll always say, it got hit in the rear, it'll have a left or right front crash sensor, it will say the, uh, crash or collision detected. Now I got to go in, I got codes, I wanna, they want me to recheck that seat. But understand, it, those crash sensors measure shock or vibration. Did it pick up a vibration from somebody ramming into the tailgate of this car? Yes. And because it saw that, right away, what did it want me to test? It wanted me to test the passenger side. So, real quickly, <clears throat> I used these weights originally. It's a rubber coat, I still use these. 25 pounds. Do you think that's exactly 25 pounds? They're not. It is now, yeah, it is now. And I didn't trim it. <clears throat> I didn't trim them. But I used rubber coated because I didn't want to stain the customer's seats. I didn't want to stain the seats. So I used the rubber coated ones I had at the house. And then I took a block that was 16 pounds and I put it in there. But let me tell you something. When you hold a block that's 16 pounds, that's only like three inches by three inches, don't swing it around too much. You'll be outside bowling. And you go up to the truck real quick and you swing it like this, and you'd be surprised. When you have $12,000 worth of custom-made cabinets inside, you don't want this bouncing around. You will cry when it dings one of the doors. And by the way, my toolboxes are all blue. Can't be red, can't be black. Has, they're all blue, the custom blue. But here's am. I'm performing a zero. Zero, there'll be nothing on the seat. Honda and Toyota, what am I going to do to that seat? Ford. I just did a Ford 500 the other day. I did a Mercury Milan uh, Friday before I came here, uh, before I left to start doing this. What do I got to do with the seat? It's got to be where? All the way back. The back, right, the back upright has to be what? All the way forward. The headrest has to be what? Down. And there has to be, that seat has to be, if it's inclined up, we got to push it down. The height adjustment. If there is, let me ask you a question. This is the second part of the question. If there's cargo bags are behind that seat, and they're full, can it throw my weight off? Anything hanging off that top of that seat headrest, can it throw my weight off? If that seat's gotta be empty. That seat's gotta be empty. Honda will tell you during the thing, put the air conditioner on. Make sure nothing's wet on the seat. Make sure there's nothing wet or any moisture in front of the seat. There's a lot of things. Ford has a temperature thing, which I don't think we have time tonight, so I'll mention it real quick. The inside temperature of the vehicle has to be a certain level or fall within a certain range or I can't zero the seat. So I ran this car and it was like 35 degrees. I ran this car. What did I have the front inside? What did I, what did I have going inside the car for about 20 minutes? The heater. I cooked this thing. And then I got the intake air temperature and I got, you know, the ECT. I brought everything up to temperature to make sure that I hit all the minimums. When I did this cold, it wouldn't pass. It wouldn't allow me to do it because the inside temperature was too cold. Well, I'll fix it. It says, then it wants like a four-hour soak. Four-hour soak, I ain't gonna wait around four hours. I cranked the heat up, I left it alone for half hour. Then I was able to do zero test. The zero test, what's on the seat? Nothing. If it asked for weight, but the Ford Taurus and the, uh, the Milan didn't ask for weight, um, Toyota and Honda, Toyota, Honda was put, say, give me a specific weight between whatnot and whatnot. Say it asked for 55 pounds. Do I know exactly what these two weigh? Can I grab a five pound that I cut down off a 10 pound? Yeah, I can put exactly what they want on there. Now, if I know that this is exactly 55 pounds, I put it in there and it's off 10 pounds, do I have a problem? Yeah, we need to take it a step further. We need to take it a step further. Now, Honda, this Toyota uses what under the bottom of the seat? How many sensors? Four. four. We're gonna replace four sensors. The car's been in an accident, I'm not going to, it's like a Ford coil. I want 35 kV coming out of the coil. I got one at 20 kV, as yeah, it's working, I'll leave it alone. Can that haunt me later? 
Mm -hmm. Sure it can. This is liability. Somebody can get hurt. It gets all four. <laughs> and you'll be surprised. When you talk about liability, you talk about that light being on, the insurance company will bend over backwards. They will. They do not want to get sued later on. I'm a real pain in the ass when it comes to that. Park and aid collision detection system. A lot of cars have this now. Inside the rear bumper, it can be in the rear or it can be in the front. It's basically radar. It's basically radar. My Ford pickup truck has got a camera in the rear. I back it up, and when I get close to something like within this table, it is going off like crazy. If I bend another foot, I'm going to make contact. That's in the mirror. So I've got this all in my, um, I've got this all in the rear bumper. But basically, the sensor pops out, and there's three Y's on here. Positive, signal return, and what? Signal itself, and ground. That's what we've got, just three wires. Positive, or the source voltage, signal return, and the signal wire itself. So there's three wires. We can put it on a scope, we can uh, figure out what's going on with it. Could the supplemental, just realize, that's rear collision. That's rear collision. You put the car in reverse, you back up, can it stop you from running into a building? Can it stop you from running into, can it stop you from running into an object that's only a foot off the ground? When you turn around, you can't see. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. I basically put them on a scope and I put my hand across them. If the scope pattern doesn't change or the buzzer doesn't change because there's an alarm buzzer, then what do I know about that sensor? It's no good. I check for power and ground. A lot of times they have the same power that feeds all the sensors. Okay, could the supplementary restraint system create a no start? Can it create a no start? Yes, does it all the time. What does General Motors mount their SRS module? Under the seat. And what's it do? It absorbs water. So I'm thinking, what if they put it under the seat to absorb the water and kill the moisture and the mold under the rug? Would it be a good idea? No? Okay. All right. <clears throat> this is a 96 Pontiac Grand Am. It uses UART. UART is part of theft. It pulled the whole UART down. Does the car start? Okay. 06, Pontiac Grand Prix. I took a picture. I said, dude, I guarantee them bolts are going to break. They snapped right off. That upper one snapped right off. Look at the rust. This car's 40,000. I just apologize about the light being on. This pad is rusted. That styrofoam, that, that rubber pad, that rubber membrane pad has got it's transferred all the rust from the floor in this module up into the pad. Can that create a nose dot? If class two goes through it, if class two is used on this, let's just say class two is used on this. I'm going to just pick a quick example. UART, it's part of the theft triangle. The key through the UART back to the instrument cluster because it doesn't have a body control module. That's basically the body or the central, central module. <clears throat> I couldn't talk to the car. If this, I'm going to use an example, if this is class two, I wouldn't be able to talk to anything on class two, because what would it be done? It would be pulled down, shorted either to the body of the car, so say I got a five volt signal or a seven and a half volt signal going up and down, I've just now took that signal and yanked it down, or I could have pulled it up and if it hit a power source. But just understand, this can give us multiple SRS codes, if this was hooked up to class two, in class two, we go from the pass key, pass key number two, the body module to this, and it goes from the key to the body module to the PCM. If that data is all being transferred on class two, and this is class two, let's just say it was, let's class two, and we bring class two down, can that key talk to the body module? Can the body module send the, the coding saying, or the password to say, turn those injectors, complete that circuit? No, it can't. It can't. So it doesn't surprise me when it becomes a no stop. It doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I want to run, this is food for thought. I want to run this by you. Gee, what time we got? got 10 o'clock. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to run across three of these. I'm going to get to one case study. I just want to get some food for thought in your, in your mind right now. I want you to look at things like I look at. I get called before the accident. I clear the codes and program the module, do what I have to do after the accident, after the work has been done. Impact collision damage number one. Did the SRS system work as designed? It's my question to you. 
We're going to look at these and you tell me what you think. <clears throat> now, forget the guys from New York. We will not hold that against the car. Okay? All right? If you're in New York and you got cut off by somebody and some idiot driver cut you off without turn signals, <laughs> that guy, his parents learned how to drive in my state. And they passed this skill off to their siblings. Okay? <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> that's, all, that's the only thing I can say. Okay. This is an 07 Subaru front impact collision damage. It contacted the next car. It was doing 50 miles an hour. And it contacted the next car. Do you think that's moderate to severe? <clears throat> no, but I made this. I'm a serious question. Moderate, let's say moderate to severe. I'm just, I want to hear your reply. I know my thought. <clears throat> okay. Now, see this little yellow conduit right here? Little piece of yellow, you little piece of yellow. I don't know if you can see that. You probably don't black, you're black and white, but that's a impact sensor. Right here, there's a section of this bumper. It's got the piece of the other car embedded in it. What this car has done, this collision, has bent the frame that that collision sensor sits on. It crushed all the radiators, it snapped all the cylinders off the valve, valve timing, variable valve timing, and cracked the variable valve timing case. Okay? <clears throat> Here's the crash sensor. The frame is bent right here. Now, should it have picked up a vibration or a collision? Or an impact? A vibration or, or a shock? It should have picked it up. It, went, it hit the front of it and went over the top of it. It had to send some signal to the SRS module. And the module, what is suppression? Suppression means what? The SRS module has done what? Under, it, nothing's being deployed. And then if it's single stage, it's what? It's what kind of severity? It's a moderate. If it's a dual stage, if it wants to deploy both airbags, what do we have? A severe. Okay, let's jump inside the car for a minute. And again, everything's crushed in this car. Forget the fact it's in New York, we're not going to hold it against the car. Okay? <clears throat> All right, let me ask you, did any modules deploy? No. What do you see with the driver? What do you see with the passenger? No. Nothing went off. Let's take another step. Did any SRS modules deploy? What about the seat reels? I can pull the seat out and I can flex the, the belt. And I checked the pretensioners too. But these are built into the seat belt, the seat belt reel. I flip this back and forth, the belts aren't locked. There's no SRS light on this car. It does a self-test and passes. So are there any open circuits in this car? 98, we obviously had some kind of strategy problem. Two open circuits, I passed a what? A self-test. And I know they were deployed. I was sitting on the belts for six months. They weren't in front of me. Where were they? Behind me. For 250,000 road miles, for 100,000 hours of idling, what wasn't on on my van? The airbag light. Okay. These module, these, the seat pretensioners did not ignite. They did not deploy. I don't want to use ignite. That's the driver's. Here's the passenger. Any problem? Side airbag. Does that look deployed? Again, I will tell you right now, the light comes on and clears. <clears throat> okay, do you think something should have um, deployed? Yeah. I believe so. I believe so. But I'm telling you right now, before this car, if we can't disconnect the battery like this gentleman says, which is the way to do it, and where we're going to find it, the OEM, because it can change from one vehicle to another, one mile to another, in the same year. Possibly. Can it change from year to year? Can one crisis say three minutes and the next year say five? We need to look it up. We need to be safe. It only takes a couple minutes to be safe. I believe something should have went off. If we can't disconnect the battery, which they don't want to, because they got to get it up a um, uh, um, frame machine, they want to bring it around the back to the, the paint booth and whatnot, what am I going to make sure they disconnect? The crash sensors. Could they be too sensitive now? Yes. The adjuster's already seen his car. He gave him whatever one had. Guys from New York, we'll just fix it. Um, <clears throat> Yankee fan. And um, we'll put it in there. But you, how are you going to tell him that we hit a pothole or we went up the frame machine or we gave it a pull and now we need a curtain? 
We got the curtain airbags went off, the seat belts went off, we need a headliner, we possibly need some plastic panels. What, what's gonna happen? He's gonna say, dude, I was just there, what did you do, right? So I'm just, I want you to be safe. Understand, they can be a lot more sensitive. Impact collision number two. Did the SRS system work as designed? I think we have a long way to go. Me personally, I think we have a long way to go. But that's only my opinion. Now, I do about two or three hybrids a week. And what I do is, I, most of the ones I work on, is I disable them. If the front tires are turning in the same direction, what are we creating in that motor? Voltage. AC voltage, but we're creating a huge magnetic field. Like, not like an ejector or a coil, which we are creating a magnetic field, when we shut the power off, well, excuse me, we open the ground circuit, what happens to the magnetic field? It collapses. These motors are real large, and they've got large windings. Can we have a large magnetic field? If the relays are held, get activated by the auxiliary battery, and let's say they're a quarter volt apart, is there a chance that we could have a voltage spike? Possibly. Could it jump those points? And where is it looking to go? It's looking to go to ground. The wires for this car, the motor wires are fine. Every wire that comes out of that inverter is either crushed, damaged, or the terminals are exposed. If he pulls this up the ramp truck and this hood bounces, it sparks. Okay, oh, the, the guy saw this, the adjuster, said get Dave out here, get your guy out here. I want to make this car safe. We're not going to repair it. It is going to the auction. It's going to go to the insurance auction yard. It'll be auctioned off. It says, danger warning, high voltage wires are exposed. Don't touch without lineman's gloves. Now, the motor is broken. The intake is ripped right off. The motor's cracked. The, the transmission, the CVT, and the inverter are shoved under the dash. He hit this thing about 40 to 50 miles an hour. There was a person in the driver's seat in this car. They have a crash sensor on the side of this hybrid right here to detect a collision. The power works. I took the seat out. I went to put my hands, got a smart key. I felt, I heard the chirp, I opened the door, I got in. This car's live. <coughs> this car's live. It's sitting in the living room and it's live. Got pretty well wrecked, right? Okay. Did any modules get deployed? Do you think that's a moderate crash, enough to crack the engine in half, break the intake off, and take the CVT and jam it that I can't get the cover on without prying the front off, which I did. And I isolated, I pulled down, and I isolated the motor windings. And they're AC voltage, right? And I pulled them down out of the inverter, and I taped them all up. And then I put them back up in the inverter, I moved the tabs out of the way, and they're totally isolated. So at least it'll go up a ramp truck. I told the guy, you want to be totally safe with this car? And it's a hybrid, if the wheels are turning the same way, it generates electricity, what should we be using? Dollies. They're like $79 each or a pair. I tell my body shops this day, get the dollies. Can we use them other than a hybrid car? Yeah, get them, you know. Do you see anything wrong with the steering wheel? Anything wrong with the passenger side? I don't know if there was a passenger, but definitely the guy was driving, and it was a 40 to 55 mile, 45 to 55 mile an hour crash. Okay, I can take the seat belts and go like this with them. These are the pretensioners are in the reels. I can move them, and I said, just for heck of it, I know the light doesn't come on, but let me check the seat belts. And it was that one in the picture that said, how many ohms? 2.4 ohms. That was from this car. And I go, dude, he goes, Dave, you want to check in? Then check it. I said, I want to check these seat belts. I want you to see if there's high resistance, low resistance. No, 2.4. 2.4, is that what we've been seeing? Yeah. Okay. Curtain side airbags, did they go off? Did that panel pop off? No, there's just... <clears throat> what do you think? Do you think that's a moderate crash? This stuff keeps me up at night. I need to know. But we got, a, we got a sensor that gave us a reading for the front. Now realize that the control module itself makes the calculations. I can go in two same year cars. I think it was a Jeep and a, and a van, same year, but it's Chrysler vehicle. One will use crash sensors and one won't. How can you test the crash sensor? You can't. 
You cannot. If we put a resistance tax on it, you're going to get 6 million or 13 million ohms. <clears throat> There's no way to test it. It has to do a self-test. However, <clears throat> if I put a scope on it, I can see it doing a, a test on itself. I can see one that doesn't work out of straight lines. And then I'll have one that works, and I'll, but I don't think we'll get into the laboratory. I mean, when I get through the last uh, slide of the first case study, when we get through the case study, just remind me, I want to hit that, the, I got a waveform library. I want to flip it through, it'll take me two seconds. I won't stop anywhere, but I want to show you what a seatbelt looks like. I want to show you what, if I don't see that, now I'm making a good waveform library. Every time I have a bad one, I put a bad one in there too. This is bad. I got good powers and good grounds. I got good com communication to the module. If I got good communication to the module, I got good powers and grounds, could that module be working and my scan tool can't talk to it? Yeah, but could I have the scan tool that should be able to talk to it? It's got good powers, good grounds, but it's dead. Inoperable. Yeah, I'll check the two, the two signals that are going to the crash sensor. If this thing is zero volts, this thing's down. And that lights off. But what I'm saying is, if you don't know the, the, the ability of equipment, I did a Volvo one day, and I want to bring this up, because we won't hit all the case studies tonight. I did a Volvo, I came to the shop, the battery was dead. I plugged it in. The airbag system on a canned vehicle is on medium can. It's not on high can on the data communicate, it's on medium can. I get in the car, I go to pick it up, and I know with a Volvo, I've got to ju I can't just go in the SRS module and clear the codes. I gotta go in the central electronic module and clear the codes. And they'll put the seatbelt buckle lights out, it'll, it'll put, once those codes are erased in the central module, it'll shut, it'll get rid of the, the codes, that, codes that I've been trying to clear, the DTC, which are uh, voltage threshold failures, uh, self-test and I can clear those codes. I go in there, I got my scan tool in my hand. I got the, it, it works on all my volvos. It's specifically for my volvos. And I feel it buzzing. Have you ever had a scan tool buzz? I've never either. I've been doing this a long, I'm an old guy. I go, dude, what did you just do? Oh, the battery's dead. So I put the charger on. What did you put it on? I put it on stop. 400 amps. It took out my candy module, which is the can communication data line. I can't talk to that airbag module, but I can't talk to everything else on that on the medium speed can. Is it the vehicle, or is it me? Is it my equipment? How can I really check it real quick? Check the powers and the grounds, and I check for communication. If I check for powers and grounds, and the communication's good going to it, but, and I can communicate with every other module on that can, medium speed. Does that module work? No. But if I can't talk to any other modules on that data circuit, I'm not going to quickly condemn that. Now I go to the, I went to the airbags. I got good signals. Dude, we're going to stop right here. Something's going on in my tool. I got to check it on another car. So I come back and I says, it's going to be a couple weeks. This car will rush? Nope. Not, it's going to sit there for a couple weeks. I got to send out my scan tool. He said, because you had it plugged into the low, he says, did you have a voltage surge? I go, I want to go into it. He goes, I'll tell you what kind of car it was plugged into. Go ahead. It was a Volvo and he named what it is. He goes, what happened? I said, dude turned on the battery charger and he put it on start. It was like 400 amps. I said, the thing buzzed. He goes, well, the candy module is 600 bucks. The scanner could cost you five to 6,000 if we couldn't reuse some of the boards. So basically the candy module acted like a fuse. I was like, yes, yes. I was so excited to spend money. <clears throat> because it was a lot less money. So I walk in the car, I go, don't touch nothing. Now if I want to make that circuit up live and working, what do I'm going to use? What's under that car? I'm that car. A junction, a junction box. A lot of shops don't have jumper boxes. If they do, are they charged? No, but they come out, they spark the thing together. They, I guess they wish they were welders. And then they connect it right on. And I'm sitting there going, going nah. and I shut it off, it's going, nah. I said, I got a car, what are you doing? And he's walking around, what did, you just, what did you just do? What do you mean, I didn't do nothing. What did you just, this thing's buzzing. It sounds like my alarm clock in the morning. He goes, well, the battery was dead and I gave you some current. How much current did you give me? <laughs> Dude, you like to weld. I can't weld with this stuff. 
The screens don't work that way. Uh, case studies were yep. deployed. Did, uh, was there a serious injury? Was no serious injury. Oh, that's kind of funny. It is kind of funny because I'd expect to see glass, you know, the body. I hated that. I, I hated that as a kid. What, did not hit the windshield. So what works? Well, well what, what, if the seatbelt works, when we do a pre-breaking, what should the seatbelt do if it works? It should lock. So the guy's head never hit the windshield or the steering column. That's a high head too. Yeah. But look with the Volvo. It was right on top of that bumper. It was the bumper and just right on top of it. It bent the frame. And this is just food for thought. <clears throat> Usually the nose goes down, right? Well, yeah, if you hit the front. And then we get a high hit. Well, one, well, a high no. hit doesn't blow it back. So it kind of, no, because, it, it, because it's not the sensor. I see sensors get cracked as a matter of the Right. Time. Fords. The right. Yeah. Because the sensor, it just proves to you that the sensor isn't what makes the call. Right. No, no, That's no, my no, point. No, it's just a signal in, and we have to get to voltage thresholds. Yeah. But you wonder, you say, how high can that voltage threshold be if it, if it gave an input of a, a vibration or a shock when it's mounted toward the end of a, 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 a frame rail and it bent the frame rail? And it broke the sensor. Yeah. No, no, but see what I'm saying is I think it would have should at least, at least, let's say, took him out of suppression and pulled the seat down. So even though we pre-braked and we locked up the belt because the belt worked, at least trip the light. At least trip the light, or at least pull, make the distance. Don't allow the distance to increase between the occupant and the cover. So let's put a pretension on. This is my thought. I, I put those up there to hear your thoughts. Somewhere, so keep it coming. Somewhere in there, you would think that you could monitor the data from the <clears throat> Well, one of my friends does that. <clears throat> yeah, because people ask me, how many modules do you do that I do that go in the trash? Everyone goes in the trash. No one's coming down because unless there's a fatality, then you don't get the car to begin with. Uh, but my buddy, had, we ran out of time. We're going to use it on the second night. He's got all the data. He's got one. He goes, I want to show you something. It went from 50, 60, 70, 80, and then one frame later, it went from 80 miles an hour down to zero. It don't show you after that. But that is the brake speed, the vehicle speed of the car. Brake speed implied, the RPM. The dude looks like we went out on the highway or went around somebody, right? 50 to 80, 30 mile an hour was up two frames. I didn't get the measurement of the frames. It wasn't a scope. But it will be in our second class. It went from 80 down to zero in one frame. Where did that car come to? A stop. <laughs> and then the data is blank after that. Who keeps that? I don't know. Can they read it? Yes, they do. There is memory in there. There's capacitors, whatnot. But that's not something that, it's a tool that gets it. And let's face it, we have normal um, scan tools. It could be in there. I wouldn't know how to get to it. I'm thinking when they do crash test, they get better. Right. <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> yes. That's going to be playing instead of the, what middle-aged women shouldn't do. It's going to be playing before the next class. I'm just getting permission right now from NASDAQ. I want to play those videos and the dummy sitting in the car. And you want to see the difference between a five star and a three star? Half that dummy's out the front door during that crash. They were doing front crashes where they hit flat. Now they're doing front crashes where they hit a point. Is that more of an impact? They're hitting the side of that car with a ram, with, with, a, veg, with a wedge now. They're not just hitting frontals, but I want to be, have permission to play it because if we tape it, I want permission, okay? We'll use a lot of resources for this. Safe Car, uh, General Motors website, Toyota's factory website, Ford's factory website. Ford's got a, a, a thing that you can use. It's called Digital Snippets. I mean, I did a lot of research because I want to know the specific stuff, but I do that same research every week regardless. I've been doing research on SRS for about five years now. I've been working on it for 30 years. But is it SRS when I was back when I was a kid? Or I had a knee bolster, a collapsible steering column, and what? When I locked up the seat, what should the belts do? So that is a new technology. What I thought last night was the newest technology in the world. And it kept me up half the night. And I called my wife at 2.30 in the morning. She goes, what are you doing? I go, hell, I'm up. I figured I could text you a message. 
I got from 2.30 to 6 to, to finish three sentences. She texts me right back, what are you up? I says, guy told me something in class. Oh, great. We're going to be up for a week. I'll know by 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. I couldn't find the information I wanted. She called at 8 o'clock and I said, what's Pierre doing today? I'll give him the message. All I want is Pierre writing before this class. Just write before. And you promised me he would. <clears throat> then he called you a bum and all this stuff and stuff. But <clears throat> something about you didn't buy him lunch, you didn't buy him dinner. Or <clears throat> Nothing, new. Nothing new. Okay. I want you to look at one more, please. Again, I'm looking for feedback. So your questions are the same questions I have when you get in the car. Okay. Impact collision damage number three. Did the SRS system work as designed? The last one. I just want to get a little feedback. This is the stuff I see. Here's a 2009 Cadillac Escalade. This is a hybrid. But forget it's a hybrid. It's still an Escalade. <laughs> yeah, because it hit the tree, right? Okay. The front bumper got damaged. The front bumper got damaged, right? The grill got scratched up. The hood's pretty good. I don't think they did anything to the hood. It looks like it's arched, but it's actually up. This fender took a direct hit right here. It crumpled this fender up into that driver's door. Okay? Moderate to severe? I don't think moderate. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the seatbelts should have done their job. Okay. Did the airbag go off? It's a catalog. Dude, you got these options, man. You got to use them. I'm Dr. Dre. Hey. All right. The airbag went off. The airbag went off. Let's take this one step further. What about the seat? The seat, all the extra tension is right there. And I know that's extra, that's extra slack, and it took up the room between the occupant and what? The cover, right? And then I go to the end, it's as tight as could be. Did that work? Yeah. To something that I would have thought that would questionably call it a moderate hit. But I saw moderate hits, and it's driving me nuts because it keeps me up at night. Why didn't it at least do the seats on that 07? The guy was from New York, the car don't like the driver, you know, don't like the state, don't like the pollution, don't like the taxes, I ain't gonna work. You know, you don't even wash me, I'm not doing it. You're on your own, dude. Here comes the car, are you looking forward, you know? But this thing, this thing did to me did what it's supposed to do, but I think it did one step more. I want to go over diagnosing and one case study and we're out of here, okay? Can you guys give me like five more minutes? Well, this is how I approach every car. Get the vehicle's complete history. Can we always get the complete history? No, no they're auction cars, used cars. Let's get as much information as we can. And we care about collision damage and repairs if we're dealing with SRS. Agreed? Or wiring or any kind of major work. Record all the vehicle information. There are some cars like Toyota, they're going to give you 52 PIDs. They're going to give you the pre-tensioner uh, and the airbag module of all the resistance. They will tell you the weight on each four corners of the seat. I put in General Motors. Is the mill light illuminated? Yes. What's the battery voltage? 13.4. Is the seat belt buckled or unbuckled? Dude, that's all you get. That's all you get. So some of them are going to have a lot of information, some are not. I want to record it. I want to record it. If you go out and it's an on-demand or continuous monitor code, and I go out and I yank out that plastic trash on the balls on the seat, and the problem goes away, could that light go off? Yeah, so I want to eliminate everything. Uh, and I want to do it quickly. Next, perform a visual inspection, but don't touch nothing. Let's find out the trash is under there, but let's not do anything. Let's look for major body work. Let's try to figure out why when we hit a pothole, we set off $9,600 worth of airbags. Could there have been a pre-existing accident? Can we have a light on because of a pre-existing accident where something got deployed but didn't get fixed? Yeah. Could we have sensors that are too sensitive right now because they took a good impact? There's, part, there's endless possibilities. Okay. Next, scan the SRS module for DTC's current and history as well as data bits. Record all the information. Before you begin your diagnosis, it's in black. Locate and read what? The arming and disarming procedure. I need to make you safe, I need the vehicle to be safe. Just take the five minutes and locate it. 
Check for TSBs and recalls. Read system description operations, and I always want you to print out a schematic. And I'm going to be honest with you, I got Mitchell on demand, I got all data, Identifix and everything. I use Mitchell because I want to look at the wiring diagram on one page. All data starts here, <laughs> came over here, oh, it's all seats, where the hell that come from? Okay, and then I'm right, seat heaters, and then I'm back over here again. Right? But what does all data, I mean, Identifix do? Not Identifix, excuse me, Mitchell on demand. They do. Yeah, I say Identifix. Yeah, the color two SG one. The Identifix will give you the uh, schematics, but they usually manufacture copies. That's why I like to see they'll have one or two pages of SRS, and like the gentleman said, they're all color copy. You can view it that way, and that's the quickest way to do it to find it real quick. All right, tools we need: electronic information. Electronic. Inf I work from the dealer. We used to get a one-inch uh, book of electrical books on a certain model, a certain year. I'd be chasing wires that didn't exist. By the end of the year, the supplements would come out, they're about four inches thick. So I know the electronic information sometimes gets updated quicker than what? The regular manuals. Uh, scan tools. Factory scan tool possible. I say factory only if you want to do some programming. If I use a Ford IDS and I go to reprogram a module, do as-built data, I'm just pushing a bunch of buttons. It's real simple. But I don't knock generic scan tools because generic scan tools have come a long way with the software and stuff. You probably have the same capabilities I do. But I just don't use as many of them you guys do. Load device for piles and grounds. What's that going to be? A headlight. It's going to pull three or four amps. We're not going to use it on the, right directly to the PCM, but we're going to use it on power and ground circuits that are external to the computer. Now, if I put a DVOM, if I put a test light or a Noid light, can that light illuminate and read the voltage of a power and ground, say 12.6 volts? Am I guaranteed that those circuits can carry any kind of current? No, because it could be a bad connection, green depth or whatnot. So I want you to use the load test. Again, assortment of load devices. Even though you see a bunch of them right now, I want to pass this around. This is the Volvo one. This one here, I want you to read the the resistance on it, and tell me if it hasn't fit into the range of 90% of the stuff you've seen tonight. Real quickly, headlight tester, 10 bucks. I just take flexible timing leads and put them on there. Take them out of your toolbox. You haven't used a timing light in years, right? If you haven't used it in years, has the guy next to you used it in years? Use his. Let him use your light. Okay? DVOM, uh, and a scope if possible. Scope is really really good thing to use. Um, and you get used to seeing good and bad waveforms. And I'd like you guys to build a library. I get boxes of these load to tools. Boxes of these things. If I don't have $600, I got $1,000 worth in there. These blue ones, I use 99% of the time. I check them before I use them. 39 bucks. Half these are still in bags. They fit fusions and focuses and every different make and model. Right now, 1.8 to 2.5. Has that been following the range we've been in? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to keep it quick and easy. I even have the factory load tools. The Chrysler load tools. Do I drag all this stuff out or I grab that little Volvo? Volvo. Grab the Volvo. Now, jumper wise, I explained this at break to a bunch of guys. These, be cautious. Remember, we do a self check. We're looking for resistance in that igniter circuit. Are these, can we guarantee there's no resistance in these? We use these every, every day, right? We pull them out. Do we heat them up? Is there a chance we can create resistance? Mine all have resistance. I'd rather you guys use short, straight, quick jumper wires. If we're checking for 2.4 ohms, and say it's going to go from a range from 1.5 to 3.5, can I have three additional ohms on one of these wires? Yeah, so be very cautious when you use that. Because we could have a code that's the same code, but we don't think we're fixing anything. It could be a bad clock spring. It could be a bad connection. But as long as we have this style of jumper cable hooked in, we think we still have a problem. I don't want you to replace pots if you don't have to. Uh, airbag deployment. I mean, I got these tools. <clears throat> There's nothing funner than doing it yourself. Okay? Now, you're supposed to you take the actual other tool that comes with this. It's a big box. You're full, full of sand and water. You're going to weigh it down. You're going to strap the thing there. I'd rather have those jumper wires that are 30 feet long, sit over there with, a, you know, 1.6 uh, amps and go, bop! But that's just me. I'm weird. Um, one quick case study. Food for thought and then you get out of here. 
2009 GM Sierra SRS message. This is the stuff we're going to run across. I'm going to do simple ones and hard ones, but I'm gonna, these are average for me. 2009 GMC Sierra SRS message and warning lights illuminated. It says on the instrument cluster, service airbag and what's illuminated. Okay, car's got like 3,500 miles on. I take the tech two, supplemental inflatable restraint. I go to that, it says view all DTCs. Can you see that? Hit the button, same thing your scan tools do at your shop. Now this is what I want you to read. I usually see system configuration problem. It's B1001. This is a B1019. It says system configuration error in component installed. Incorrect component installed. The module is seeing something it doesn't like or doesn't recognize. So I said to the guy, I walk in the shop again, I go, dude, you told me you put a windshield in and an upper pad on this car. Okay? So I come in, I say, okay, it was during a storm. What's the chance we could have a voltage surge and screw up the, the software in the PCM, I mean the SRS module? Slim to none, but there's lightning storms all the time that happen. So I said, real quickly, let me just recalibrate that module. I don't want to replace any parts. Oh, I get the module for tomorrow. No, we don't replace any parts. There's no guessing. So I find the sensing and diagnostic module. That's what GM's called. I put the VIN number in. It goes in here, and it says you got the same, you're going to reprogram this, this module with the same calibration. We don't suggest doing it. Do you want to say yes? I always okay it. I run the test. It loads into my laptop. Now it loads into the car. When it's all done, after the, uh, the, if the module gets programmed, shut the key off for a minute. That's critical. And I'm going to tell you guys, if we ever cover, ever cover programming, General Motors car, if somewhere during the middle, your computer goes into hybrid and whatnot, a cord gets kicked out, do not shut the key off. Leave it on. The computer could be gone, but I want you to, try, I want you to fix the problem and reflash it again with the key on while it's powered up. Do not power it down. Okay. The system configuration, incorrect component installed, DTC resets immediately. So I go back in the shop and I say, what did we change again? Dave, the upper dash pad. Took about 10 minutes. Now this car has got two seat belts that lock. It has two front airbag modules and it has a crash sensor. And it has an on and off key for the passenger side. So real quickly, they're waving, did I do something? Oh, he's exercising. Um, Simulators we use, how can I isolate all the parts? If, they, if it sees something they didn't like, if it created a high resistance or something, it should have said that. But why don't I take a load tool and disconnect each one of the pretensions in each one of the modules? Can I do that? It'll either see the module or see the resistance value and pass it. But there's no component attached to that what? Resistance to come up with the incorrect component. So I did that. I did it on the, on the seat rails. I did it on the you know, driver's steering wheel, and I did it on the passenger. Now, the frontal crash sensor, it's, a, it's, a, it's an IC circuit, integrated control circuit. There's no resistance. It'll be six million, it doesn't mean nothing to me. Why do I unplug it? It'll be an open circuit. If it's an open circuit, I clear the code, and I cycle the key, can it tell what's plugged into it? I'm thinking it can't. I'm thinking it's an open circuit. It can't tell that the wrong component's there. So I do all that and rewrite it, and it stays on. It stays on. What would you guys do next? Call huh? Call, call Dave. No, we just called John. We're in I need to talk to the tech again. So I grabbed the owner of the tech. I said, I'm missing something here. Would you please tell me what you did? And he said, I pulled the earbag module. I, he said, I, it, that module, it all says that it, it's lit up. I looked at it, made sure it was connected, and I took the upper pad off. Now, the upper pad, he said, it took me about 15 minutes. I said, did you disconnect anything? He said, yeah, the passenger side bag. But I, I can get to that by moving the glove box. I checked terminal tension. I put stable in 22, and it doesn't have that code. But every time I put a simulator or disconnect something, make an open circuit, it comes up with the incorrect component. I'm saying, what doesn't it see? So he goes, do you want me to order a module? No. No, I don't. We're not going to I need some time to think about this. So I worked on it for about two and a half hours, and I went home. I said, dude, it's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Tell me you ain't going to have the truck for another day. I need to think about this. So I came back the next morning, and I said, call the customer right now and tell me if that light was on before. No, we created it. 
Was the light on when you brought it down with a broken windshield? Do you have a tow? No, we drove it down with a limb coming through the dash. Okay, dude, I, I said, let me grab the technician. I said to the technician, I want to remove that pad. You know what he says to me? In front of the owner, he says to me, what are you trying to accomplish? I want to remove that pad. Would you please do that for me? I want to see if you put your arms and hands down on something where you could have made contact with something. Opened the circuit, made a loose connection. He goes, there's no wiring under the dash. I like, go, are you serious? Like 300 feet of it. So what you, it's like, where'd that go? You know what I mean? They just, what do they got? Fairy dust that goes from here to here? I don't know. <laughs> so I says, please, would you do that? And he says to me one more time, what are you trying to accomplish? I said, I just want to take a visual look. What do you want to look at? I want to look at the airbag, I want to look at all the wiring, and I want to look behind that instrument cluster. He goes, the instrument cluster works. And I go, wait a minute, that light works. But that instrument cluster is a major part of the SRS system. That light works. That light is on what? It could be on class two. It could be on anything. It's a 2009. Could there be a separate circuit going from the airbag module? Could there be? Separate than the class two that's going to be sheared. There could be. Dude, I want you to take that cluster off. Let me do the cluster first. And the boss is standing me. I says, he goes, it takes five minutes. I had it off three times. Wait a minute. No, no, no. I asked you. Okay, let's not bother Go here. Take the cluster off. And he did. He had it on five minutes. But don't pull it off. I want to pull it off. So I pull it off. This is what I have. I can't clear it. Been on the car three or four hours. Can't clear it. And I said, it had to be something we did. I need to check to see if we get an open circuit. I, I pull it back gently. I look at the connector. There's about eight inches. It's clean. After that, it's all dusty. So the tech sitting next to me, I go, hey, this looks funny. So I held the dash, and I, he, I pushed it in with a loud snap. He goes, you didn't break it, did you? <laughs> I said, no. Did you hear that snap? He said, it was loud. Did you crack something? I said, no. I latched the connector back in. It was out about an eighth of an inch. I cycled the key. You know what went off? It said incorrect component. It actually was on a separate circuit from the airbag module, and it was, it was an open circuit. So here's my buddy with no further delay, Mr. Dave DeCourcy out of Massachusetts. So when he says potty and pot the car and stuff like that. Pots. And pots. That's right. Pots. It was, I was pots in your last night. <clears throat> not pots. It's pots. <laughs> You'll uh, maybe need a translator. Anyway, Dave DeCourcy. Thank you, G. Thank you. This is going to be one of two parts. One of two pots. Parts. Pots. <clears throat> you guys can understand me. But this is one of two parts. We, I'm going to try to get to the case study tonight. We can get to one case study, and that's about it. The second night's going to be all case studies, and it's, you know, it covers the one.